Hello, Leapers. Welcome to the Quantum Leap Podcast. I'm Christopher DeFilippis, and I am here with Allison. Hi, Allison. Hi. And with Albie. Hi. And welcome to our Leap Day special, Spectacular. It is Leap Day 2024, and we thought what better way to celebrate it than to honor our good friend Matt's memory. Um, to do so, we have an all-star cast extravaganza. We are going to be doing a table read of the 2003 proposed Quantum Leap reboot script by Trey Calloway called A Bold Leap Forward. And joining us Ooh. is... Author Trey Calloway. Hi, Trey. Hello, hello. Thank you for having Yay. me. We have uh, the stars of Quantum Leap, Caitlin Bassett. Hi, Caitlin. Yay. Hello. We Thanks have for having me. We have Nan Rissa Lee. Hi, Nan. Hey, all. We have Georgina Riley, Janice herself. Hi, Georgina. Yeah. Hello. And we have the godmother of Quantum Leap, the co-creator and the executive producer and director and just all around Quantum Leap standard bearer, Deborah Pratt. Welcome back yes, to the show, Deborah. Yes. Thank you. So we, uh, like I said, we decided to do this and um, we were all excited. And um, I thought, what's, uh, you know, we lost Matt. His let um, who wrote this script, and it was the first time that Trey had told anybody really how it all went down back then. So, Trey, for people who might not have heard that interview, can you just give us the short version of how this script came to be? <laughs> yeah, it's still a little bit of a mystery, and you really should listen to Matt's interview with me where I tried to uncork as much of it as possible, but the short... Uh, <laughs> The short version of it is uh, I was brought in uh, by Sci-Fi to, after after many years of being a fan myself of the original series, thank you very much, Deborah. Um, I was I was brought in to uh, pitch for a two-hour uh, relaunch of the series, and uh, that first involved meeting with Don, and uh, and then meeting with the folks at Sci-Fi, and I came in with my original pitch. Uh, and uh, they all dug it, and then I was sent off to to write it. And I wrote it, turned it in. Everybody dug it even more. Uh, the plan was to shoot in Australia. I was told by Don and uh, the the network to start meeting with directors, and so everything was moving in the right direction until suddenly, for reasons which are still slightly mysterious to me, Mr. Belisario decided that he wanted to go another way, and so. That was the end of the project, but I had a blast doing it, and it's been a great trip down memory lane to sort of blow the dust off this thing and remember what I enjoyed about it in the first place. Well, we really appreciate you giving us the okay to do this, and uh, it, was, it is all for a good cause. Uh, for those of you listening on the pod feed, you can find a link on the show notes, and for those of you watching us on YouTube, you will find a link below. Um, we are doing this to raise money for Matt's family, and uh, it's part of the same GoFundMe that we brought you the links for back you know, in shows back in, in December. So just take a look and please um, click on the link, donate what you can. Uh, it will mean the world uh, to, to Matt's uh, partner and, and his son. And um, I spoke to them today and um, his partner, Sharon, wanted to thank you all for doing this, for being a part of this, for helping us honor Matt's memory and his legacy. And she also wanted me to pass on her thanks for all of the well wishes and the thoughts that you expressed at the time when he had passed. It means the world to her. So thank you all. And thank you from us too on the podcast. I've said this to Dean. I've said this to anybody I can speak to, but it's the first time actually speaking to you face to face. The support that you lent us in that time is really what has enabled us to go forward with the podcast. We were sort of at sea. We didn't know what we were going to do, but just the outpouring of love that we felt from the entire cast and crew and the community is what got us through. And that's why we're here now. So thank you all personally from us to you. All right. All right. I don't want to get maudlin. So <laughs> we are going to read this script. I have assigned some different parts to different people. Um, there's going to be some gender switching because there are more male parts than we have males for. So, uh, be, you know, feel free to put on a voice, feel free to do an accent, feel free to make it as loose and as fun as you want it to be. All right. Um, we're going to start with, uh, Trey as the narrator for the prologue. And, um, we now present to you quantum leap, 
A Bold Leap Forward, written by Trey Calloway, based on the television series created by Donald P. Belisario. And Deborah Pratt. And Deborah Pratt. And Deborah Pratt. All right, here we go. Are we ready? Let's do We're it. ready. We fade in. An exterior three-story building in the daytime. It's just an old downtown brownstone full of low-rent apartments. And a super reads... May 29th, 1992. Camera starts moving toward this third story window and we hold for a peaceful urban beat and then waboom, the window explodes outward in this massive fireball and inside the building moments later, there's panicky residents that are rushing up and down smoke-filled corridors. Camera starts following the slacker and a wife beater as he's running toward a stairwell, but before he can so much as reach for the door, it flies open and firefighters come charging in from the other side. This fire captain urgently beckons the slacker on. Sir, get down the stairs now. The slacker takes them down two at a time as more hose-wielding firefighters pass him going up. Check all the rooms and keep the northwest corner wet. This old lady ain't going to last long. He charges down the hallway. The others fan out and follow it. But camera lingers on the stairwell as this one last man finally comes into view. But we've seen this firefighter before, and we know exactly why he's got an unsettled look on his face. Because Dr. Sam Beckett isn't really a firefighter. He's confused, and Sam looks around, his face is burning, his eyes are stinging. From somewhere in the smoke, we hear the sound of a baby crying, and from somewhere else, his CO yells. Thurston, check 326. Sam stumbles out of the stairwell in heavy protective gear. He passes this cracked mirror at the end of the hall and then doubles back. He winces, trying to get a good look at his reflection through the haze, but once again... It's not his reflection. Angle on the mirror where Sam beholds a ruggedly handsome man, mid-40s, with a square jaw and piercing eyes. Thurston, you hear me? Sam suddenly eyes the stenciled name on his canvas jacket, and even backward, he can plainly see who he is. Craig Thurston. Yeah, I'm on it. He looks to a door number on his left. It's apartment 326. He tries the door, but it's locked. So Sam does what any hero would do. He backs away for a running start, and then wham, he busts the door down like a muscular one-man battering ram. Inside the apartment, of course, that doesn't mean it didn't hurt. Ouch. His pain is quickly upstaged by the crying baby. He bolts through the smoke-filled apartment, searching, rushes into a bedroom, and in a crib lies the crying baby. On the floor lies her mother, unconscious, so he quickly checks mom's pulse, then gingerly lifts the baby into his arms and reaches for an emergency radio on his chest. Uh, this is Thurston. I've got an unconscious mother in 326, but her baby's still got a healthy pair of lungs. Copy that, Thurston. We'll take care of mom. Just get the baby outside. In the corridor, moments later, Sam swiftly makes his way back out of the apartment into the hallway. Black smoke rolls ominously along the ceiling. He starts to make his way back toward the stairwell until crack, the ceiling above begins to splinter and cave engulfed in flames. Thurston, look out! He rushes away from the stairwell, baby held close, as the entire roof starts to collapse behind him. He glances through the smoke to the hallway's opposite end, where light shines through the only apparent way out, a window. Hang on, baby. And with no other options, he starts to run. Camera tracks him slow-mo, an inferno chasing his heels until Sam finally reaches the end of the line and crash! Hugging the baby, Sam's body hurtles helplessly through midair, carrying them both to unavoidable death or not. Wham! Sam hits a giant inflatable stunt bag on the ground. Angle on the bag as Sam immediately rolls off the baby, which is now crying very oddly like a doll that needs new batteries, which is probably because it is and it does. He looks up, confused all over again. Reverse angle reveals his view of a full Hollywood movie crew, politely applauding his bone-jarring arrival. One of them, a pretentious director, picks up his bullhorn. Reset. Sam stands up on the bag, broken baby dangling from his hand. It's just a movie? But it seems so real. Angle on a couple of props guys with a fresh baby nearby. What does he think we are, amateurs? Probably drunk again. We should have just moved the bag and saved the world from another sequel. A couple of grips help Sam off the bag as the director pats him on the back with faux praise. You rock, Hollis. Hollis? Right. Method acting. Very De Niro. Just give us ten to relight and we'll do it again. Sam struggles to regain his land legs and follow. Hey. Again. You <laughs> wanted to do your own stunts, remember? Besides. The director Caps. Sorry. No, please. 
Besides, you got a high rise trailer, your full bar, and a lap pool. I'm sure you'll find a way to drown your sorrows. And he walks on, leaving Sam alone to gaze up at a star on the door, which reads Hollis Hansen. Inside the trailer, Sam stumbles up the stairs and plops into a chair in front of a lighted makeup mirror as he stares once more at the reflection of someone else. His old pal Al Calavici suddenly steps into view behind him, cigar clenched between his teeth like a real live, well, holographic mogul. It's like I always said, Sam, you ought to be in pictures. And as the two old friends search each other's faces for the first time in 20 years, we fade out. End of prologue. Ooh. Bravo, Good. Jennifer Bradford, channeling your inner Hitchcock. Yeah, Thank you. I love that. This is the most pretentious freaking uh, direct acting. <laughs> All right, so that was the end of the pro prologue. We're moving on to Act One. Remember, everybody, to um, click on the link to support Matt's family, donate to the GoFundMe. Uh, shall we get going? Here we go. Interior trailer. A little bit later, Sam's eyes light up. Oh. He rushes to embrace Al, arms slicing right through him. Easy, Sam. I'm just a hologram. Where have you been? Trying to get back to you. Well, what took you so long? Hey, you went to all that trouble to put my life back together. The least I could do was enjoy it a little. So it worked. Of course it worked. You're a genius, remember? You literally changed the course of my life. One minute I was a chronic bachelor crying in my beer, then you turned time on its ear, and the next thing I knew I had a wife and four daughters. I don't know whether to kiss you or kill you. <laughs> what about Project Quantum Leap? Ooh, well, uh, I guess you win some, you lose some. They cut our funding, pal. What? Right around the same time you went leaping off by yourself into the wild blue yonder, they handed me a big fat pink slip. Then they pulled the plug on the whole experiment and carted off all our gear like we were never there. You gotta be kidding. That's what I said. But believe me, Uncle Sam has no sense of humor. What about all those closed door hearings? Al shakes his head. A dog can only beg for so long before he finally gets kicked away from the table. You know, I sold and resold Quantum Leap to Congress every time I took the hot seat. But in the end, with you gone, I just couldn't convince them it wasn't all a big, expensive failure. That's not true. We did so much good. They don't care about any of that, Sam. So you saved a lot of lives, right? A bunch of wrongs. No matter how important it may have been to those folks you leapt into, the Beltway boys who pay the bills are all about the big picture and the bottom line. Well, so how'd you finally find me? Fortunately, I didn't leave empty-handed. I kept a little copy of your plans. So in between finding a new job and raising four girls, I just kept tinkering away. Then when the girls were grown and Beth passed away. Oh, well, I'm sorry. No, it's, uh, it's okay. We had a wonderful life together. And to tell you the truth, it kind of gave me the extra kick in the pants. I need to finally track you down. Bang, bang, bang. A PA knocks on the trailer door. Mr. Hansen? They're ready for you on set. Sam looks again at his movie star reflection in the mirror. Who is this guy anyway? Well, my friend, it appears this time you have leapt into the bo boffo? Boffo? If I'm saying <laughs> yeah. that right? Yes. Oh, boffo. That's a new word. Okay. Boffo box office body of none other than Hollis Hansen, internationally adored and self-loving superstar who Hollywood happens to hate. Of course, that doesn't stop them from paying him the big bucks, most of which he blows on various forms of vice. Well, I never heard of the guy. Al reaches into his pocket and removes Ziggy, a high-tech handheld computer database. He eyes its compact screen. Don't worry, you haven't missed much. Let's see, there was Big Guns, Big Guns 2, and oh yeah, you just enjoyed a near-death experience on the set of Big Guns 3. <laughs> Sounds like an impressive body of work. Believe me, if the falls don't kill you, the dialogue will. So what do I do now? Well, what do you want first? The bad news or the really bad news? Oh, I just fell three stories from a burning building with a baby in my arms. I doubt it gets much worse than that. And tell that to Ziggy. According to his patented tell it like it is technology, Hollis Hansen is going to pull his last stunt in about two hours when he takes on the front of a commuter train and the train wins. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Like I told you, this schmuck blows a lot of big coin on some very bad habits, one of which happens to be high stakes gambling. You know, the kind where when you lose and don't pay your tab, men who aren't doctors do reconstructive surgery on your kneecaps. Someone's going to ice him? To put it coldly, yes. Great. Well, I can't wait to hear the really bad news. Well, it does kind of put this guy's problems in perspective. Al takes a beat, then hits Sam with the truth. I can't say. And you can't either. Say again? 
Listen, just because you made leaping through time look easy doesn't mean it hasn't been a pain in the brain for the rest of us. I don't have six doctorates, Sam, and at my age, I don't think I have the strength to keep chasing you down. It's high time you came home. I can't do that. You can if you choose to. Come on, Al. Spare me all that quasi-spiritual hooey about how I'm in control, how I can stop traveling through time just as soon as I click my heels together and say there's no project like Quantum Leap. You know it's not that simple, so unless you got someone who's willing to take over... Bang, 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 bang. Another knock on the door. Mr. Hold Hansen? That Hold that thought. Follow me. Al seamlessly walks right through the trailer's closed door. Sam frowns, then opens it, walking right past the anxious PA. Where are we going? Um, back to set? Or, uh, not? Come on. There's someone you should meet. We cut to the inside of a limousine, where a nervous limo driver looks back at Sam through the open security glass, unaware that Al is seated right beside him. Um, should, shouldn't I at least let production know where you're going, Mr. Hansen? Al consults Ziggy. We gotta get to the soccer fields in Balboa Park, pronto. Uh, don't worry, I just need a little fresh air. Uh, can you get me over to the soccer fields in Balboa Park as soon as possible? Yes, sir. Oh, and uh, would you mind? Following the star's cue, the driver puts the glass up, allowing Sam and Al to speak openly. Okay, so things aren't exciting enough. You figured we gotta catch a game? Actually, the minute I realized this was a location shoot, I had Ziggy do a little cross-checking for me. Remember when you made a leap into a defense attorney back in 78 and got that nice lady off her murder charges? Abigail. She was innocent. Yeah, but you weren't. Okay. Maybe I crossed the line a little, but we had some serious chemistry. Yeah, well, that chemistry resulted in a little explosion, remember? Sam slowly looks up at Al. This memory is a heavy one. Sammy Joe. That's right. Nine months later, on January 25th, 1979, Abigail gave birth to your daughter. Well, half-daughter. But let's just say when the real attorney let back into your place, he wasn't fully equipped to deal with being a dad. Was it the leap? Yeah, but he had a few loose screws to begin with. So it's bad enough I fathered a child. I abandoned one while I was at it? Until now. He nods out the window and Sam follows his gaze to a crowded spread of soccer fields as the limo pulls to a stop. Sammy Joe, She's here? She prefers Samantha now, but yeah. Call it coincidence, call it fate. Either way, her team is playing in the finals today. So I figured as long as you were in the area, maybe you'd like to say hello. Al abruptly steps out through the closed limo door, and outside the limousine, his holographic form passes seamlessly. The driver exits the limo, crossing around to open the door for Sam. Parents on the sidelines almost immediately begin to notice the star, excitedly whispering and pointing. Hello. Which one is she? Number 33. Oh, and she's 12 years old now. Cute kid. What do I say to her? Whatever feels right. Sam walks toward the field as Al lingers behind, watching camera-toting looky-loos begin to converge from all sides. As a handful of young female players cluster at center field, Sam suddenly approaches. Uh, uh, excuse me. The girls take one look, and their jaws collectively hit the ground. Is he Hollis Hansen? Deborah. <laughs> he totally is! <laughs> the ball rolls right past them, and they don't even flinch. A beat later, a referee's whistle blows for a timeout. I'm, uh, I'm really sorry to interrupt your game. I was just kind of looking for Samantha. Why are you looking for me? Sam turns to see Samantha, refreshingly nonplussed. But just like a real father facing his little girl, Sam begins to stammer, quietly overcome by how much she means. Well, I... Um, uh, nice to meet you. I'm... Uh, no, who you are. You do? Yeah. I don't really like you movies. <laughs> oh. Yeah, right, well, uh, that's okay. Um, I, I didn't come around here to talk about any of that. He looks around and notices a growing crowd of looky-loos beginning to close in from all sides. <laughs> Where's your mom? Uh, she had to work. Oh. That's too bad. How about your dad? He couldn't make it. Oh. I'm really sorry. That's okay. I'll live. Uh, what can 
can I ask you something? Yeah, anything you want. Is this one of those like hidden hidden camera shows where I'm gonna get goofed and there's cash and prizes? No. <laughs> Hope you're not disappointed. No, no, I don't like those shows either. <laughs> uh, so, so uh, I guess I just wanted to be able to look at you in the eyes and tell you what a big fan I am of yours. Angle on Al, cautiously watchful as flash bulbs start going off around them, but it's not the people taking pictures that disturb him. It's the one man who isn't. He's got a gruff, menacing look that suggests he isn't here for an autograph. Al presses a button on Ziggy, which opens a small lens. Then he takes a little photo of his own. Identify. Angle on Samantha, who's trying hard not to blush over this extremely surreal situation. <laughs> uh, you're a fan of mine. Yeah. I mean, I heard a lot of great things about you. And um, I just hope you have a really good life and uh, game, you know, all of it. <laughs> gently offers his hand she accepts it and samantha may not exactly know why but she is absolutely touched oh well thanks you too not that you need it well you'd be surprised angle on ziggy which lights up an owl's hands with a ping its tiny screen reads positive identification and as another round of cameras start flashing around them the mystery man starts to move toward them Al looks up from Ziggy and immediately interrupts their moment with an air of urgency. Come on, Sam. Time's a-wasting. I gotta go. All right. Bye. Bye, then. Sam makes his way back to the limo, waving off autograph seekers as he goes. Al follows, casting worried glances over his shoulder the whole time at the man who was momentarily kept away from them by the crowd. Just outside the limousine, the driver finally manages to shut the door behind them and slowly begins to wade around the thick crowd toward the driver's side door. Inside the limo, Sam is visibly shaken by the experience of meeting Samantha. Why'd you do that to me? So you'd realize what you're missing? I know firsthand what a big difference you've made in other people's lives, but one of these days, you gotta get back to living your own. She doesn't even know me. Not yet. But believe me, she needs to. Don't you see? We could fix Hanson's problems, and then you could lead back to your own time and be there for her, not to mention yourself. Sam mulls it over in his mind for a quiet beat, and then... Well, how the hell are we supposed to fix Hanson's problems? Lock the doors and get behind the wheel before the driver makes it back. I'm serious. Go. Sam scrambles through the open security window and hops into the driver's seat, quickly thumbing the lock button just as the driver reaches for the door handle. Then he lays on the horn and slowly steps on the gas, forcing all the onlookers away from the car, not to mention the poor driver. I am so fired. <laughs> and a beat later, another car speeds off behind them, driven by the mystery man. Inside the limo, Sam nearly fishtails the black stretch around a tight corner as Al looks over his shoulder through the tinted back window at their pursuer. Grand Theft Auto just to get away from paparazzi? That's not paparazzi. Angle on Ziggy as an image of their pursuer is displayed on its compact screen. Actually, it looks a lot more like a mugshot. Ziggy just ID'd him as Carmine Giacchino, a hitman with two prior felony convictions under his belt for attempted manslaughter. Wouldn't that make him a hit and miss, man? <laughs> Look, unless you head straight for the metro station on Lancashire, he's going to finally get one right. Whoa, whoa. Wait, that's the last place I'm going, Al. Hanson gets hit by a train, remember? Yeah, but I also remember a little insurance policy I took out on you. Insurance policy? I had a bad feeling Congress was going to leave us high and dry one day. So before they did, let's just say I got a little covert myself with some of their funding. You embezzled from the U.S. government? <laughs> All I did was stow some extra cash for you inside a train station locker in case of a rainy day. I just figured if they ever cut you loose, you might at least have a chance someday of leaping to this time zone and collecting a little severance pay. They owe you that much. How much? A million bucks. A mil <laughs> Are you out of your mind? No, Sam. I'm your friend. I just didn't think it was going to get wasted on a box office bozo like Hanson. Are you suggesting that I use that cash to pay off the goon behind us? Patow! A bullet suddenly shatters the limo's back window. Holographically unharmed, Al still habitually hits the deck beneath a spray of glass. You got a better plan? Sam glances anxiously over his shoulder at the gun-toting Giacchino on their tail and then puts up the security window. Out in the street, Sam's limo darts in and out of traffic with all the grace of a rhino, at least finally managing to make it around a passing city bus, which subsequently cuts off the gunman. 
We cut to an exterior metro rail station a few minutes later as Sam's limo skids around a turn and pops the edge of the curb as he and Al bound out of the car. Take that escalator down to blue level, locker 221. The two of them make a break across a plaza toward a nearby escalator as Giacchino pulls up behind the limo and bolts out of his car as well. We're on an escalator as Sam pushes his way past people down while Al merely walks right through them and two of those people are a father and his young son. Easy, buddy. Where's the fire? Dad, that was Hollis Hansen. Really? Let's go get his autograph. Inside at the subway train platform, Sam races along looking for lockers. Trouble is, there are none. I'm not seeing any lockers here, Al. Al's confused until he looks across twin sets of subway tracks to the platform on the other side, and there they are, lockers. So I'm a little rusty. Let's go back up the escalators to the other side. Sam takes one look at the escalators and can see from Giacchino's arrival at the bottom. It's way too late for that. Hanson! I think I better take the shortcut. With that, Sam hops down onto the tracks and starts running across, the headlights of a train visibly approaching in the distance. Behind him, Giacchino scrambles to do the same, but just as he's about to cross over the second set of tracks, he glances to his right and jumps back, nearly getting run down by a train coming into the station. On an opposite platform, with the gift of time, as passengers load the train behind him and his pursuer is stuck on the other side, Sam makes his way to the lockers and finally finds number 221. Angle on that locker, which has a big combination lock on it. Al! Suddenly standing beside him, Al scrolls through info on Ziggy. Hold your horses, I'm looking. You don't remember the combination? Hey, do I need to remind you I'm the senior advisor to Project Quantum Leap? Geez, just wait till you're my age. Yeah, well, that's never going to happen if you don't help me open this locker. All right, all right. Here it is. Right three, left 24, and right back to one. Sam spins it once more in the other direction, and just as the lock snaps open, the train behind him begins to pull away. He has just enough time to grab a duffel bag inside and turn around before he sees Giacchino right in front of him, gun aimed at his gut. Oh, hi. Listen, I'm not in the mood for listening, Hanson. And neither are you and the men you owe a lot of money to. I understand. So how about you take what's inside this bag as a down payment? You know, sort of a good faith gesture of my desire to stay alive? He hands the bag to Giacchino, who stows his gun and unzips it to see a cool million in cash. It's a million bucks. You can count it if you want. I'll take your word for it. Good. So, we're cool? Giacchino puts the bag over his shoulder and smiles. Oh, yeah, we're definitely cool. But you, but I still got to kill you, which bums me out, to be honest. Because I kind of <laughs> like to think of myself as a patron of the arts. He starts to pull his gun again until... Is that me? Okay. Excuse me. Yeah. Sam and Giacchino both turn to see the breathless father and his boy hopefully standing beside them. Could we get your autograph? Sorry, son, this really isn't the best time. Hey, weren't you in The Mobsters? The keynote lights up. You saw it? Oh, it was just a little bit part. I was just looking for a little work in my spare time, and this cousin of mine was a line producer, so... Mr. Hansen, where are you going? The two men turn to see Sam scrambling back down across the tracks. Chiquino abruptly rushes after him, leaving the father and son to stare in disbelief at what's about to happen. On the tracks, Sam jumps over the last set of rails and climbs up a steel rung ladder on the opposite wall. But Giacchino is in no hurry. With the bag of money over his arm, he calmly reaches for his gun. Angle on the father, who immediately gathers up his son and heads for the nearest escalator. Let's go, son. I, I think we'll rent this one. Angle on Giacchino, who aims his pistol at Sam from behind. Come on, Hanson, turn around. I saw big guns. You took 50 rounds to the chest and still got the girl. Sam keeps climbing the rungs, and just as Giacchino begins to squeeze the trigger, honk, another train flies down the tracks right toward them, giving Sam just enough time to jump off the last rung and roll onto the platform as Giacchino kisses both his acting and his killing careers goodbye. Wham! He's gone. <laughs> Angle on the platform where the duffel bag lands, and Sam rolls over for one last look up at Al standing beside him. Shh. Ouch. That had to hurt. Just help me up, would you? But Al looks down to see a blue halo beginning to form around Sam as he lies on the floor. Al swallows hard. Not this time, pal. You gotta help yourself. Sam reacts as his entire body is taken over by the brilliant light of yet another leap into the great unknown. No, Al, wait! I can't! 
You can, Sam, and sooner or later, you're gonna have to. But for all the fear and all the hope, all either man can do next is cover his eyes against a final bright flash as Hollis Hansen's body is re-inhabited by none other than Hollis Hansen. And since the normally self-absorbed movie star has just had a serious out-of-body experience, he's not quite himself right now. Where am I? What happened to me? Al looks down at the movie star who's completely unaware he's there as police officers and reporters start spilling onto the platform around them. And then he picks up the duffel bag. You just got a second chance, buddy. And I hope to God I get one too. Al somberly walks off through the growing crowd and we fade out. End of act one. Ooh. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Deborah, keep bringing those accents. Oh, uh, we're so going to change it up. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to change it up a little bit in Act 2. Uh, but before we do, again, please uh, donate to Mad Scope Fund Me. Hello, everybody. Ellie and Sean here from Who Culture. And we would just like to continue the celebration of the wonderful Matt's life. Now, obviously, if you are watching this, then you know that he was a massive fan of Quantum Leap. But beyond that, he was also a massive fan of Doctor Who. Um, and one of the best things that I've just been informed about Matt's love for Doctor Who. Um, I'm going to tell Sean right here and everyone can listen. Did you know, Sean, that Matt was a very big fan also of the Spice Girls? Okay, so Matt had good judgment in music, is what you're telling me. Absolutely. But even better, Matt finally got to see one of his favourite groups, bands, whatever we want to class the Spice Girls as, finally realised in the Hooniverse. In the giggle. <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to use the word institution. The Spice institution. Girls are institution. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, fantastic. And obviously brought to life so brilliantly by the wonderful Neil Patrick Harris. Um, mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that was the last episode of Doctor Who that Matt was able to to watch. But what what a wonderful way uh, for his his enjoyment of Doctor Who to have ended with spice up your life absolutely wonderful um and the reason that we are here is just to remind everybody that there is a link down below um and a qr code on the screen um to the gofundme page um in order to support matt's family um his his partner and child um in this really really difficult time and if any of you could just follow that and help out it would be massively massively appreciated very much so um Thank you so much, Albie, for reaching out to us uh, as well. Um, obviously, this is a this is a tragedy, and we are so sorry to Matt's family. Um, but just what one of the things that is amazing about our fan communities is how we do rally and how we do support. So please, if you wouldn't mind, it would be be fabulous uh, if you can support in any way or share the link uh, as well. Um, thank you, thank you so much, everyone. Please donate to Matt's GoFundMe. You know where to find the links. All right, Act Two. We're going to have Deborah act as the narrator. Deborah, are you ready to rock and roll? Uh, is there an actual character, the narrator, or you're asking? No, no, just just what Trey was doing. Okay. Oh, got it. Okay. Just, yep. Exterior Massachusetts Institute of Technology Day, establishing home of some of the world's smartest people. A super reads present day. From somewhere, we can hear an old familiar voice. Of course, according to Novikov's principle of minimal action, light travels in the simplest and fastest path to its destination. Lecture hall, camera pans across a wide hall packed with college students, projected on a screen before them, an image of two black holes and the wormhole stretching through space and time between them. But since action is seen as a measure of the energy involved in both traversing a path and the time it takes to do so, there must be a law of nature which prevents the paradox of time travel. A young co-head impatiently raises her hand. She is in her early 20s, but her pensively pretty face feels older. Not that that should come in as any surprise since we saw the same look when she was 12. This is Samantha Fuller, all grown up. You're muted. Oh, I think you're muted. Oh, you're Caitlin. muted. You're on mute. I'm muted. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try again. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, here we go. 
This is Amanda Fuller, all grown up. <laughs> uh, excuse me. Angle on Samantha's boyfriend, Gerard, seated right between her, seated right beside her. He's a nice looking young guy, but clearly uncomfortable over the way she insists on picking a fight. No, oh, not again. But Samantha will not be silenced. Okay, with all due respect, Professor, I thought this was a quantum physics lecture, not a science fiction class. Angle mm -hmm. on Professor's hand as he thumbs a key on his laptop, causing the PowerPoint presentation. Camera tilts and we finally reveal the familiar, if not slightly older face of Al. He looks over his glasses at her. And what makes you think time travel is only science fiction? Well, just be, sorry. Well, just because there's nothing in the laws of physics to prevent it doesn't mean there's anything in those same laws which allows it. Mm, in other words, just because there's no law that says you can't drink a keg of beer in 30 seconds doesn't mean you couldn't. The class snickers, but Samantha tries to remain serious, unsure where he's going with this. I guess. Ah, but what if he did? Travel through time? Drink the keg. Hmm. You'd be hammered. <laughs> Again, the class laughs. She looks quizzically at Gerard, but he can only shrug. He's in no position to help her now. That's one way of putting it. Or you could say you were experiencing an alternate form of reality. Am I right? I suppose. Al goes in for the kill, slowly building in intensity. And what if that alternate reality was just one of many? And what if this room, this campus, the world we live in, hell, the whole universe around us was just one in an infinite variety of parallel universes? That would mean those universes get split into infinite copies of themselves like variations on a theme, that all possible outcomes of all possible experiments must happen somewhere in space and time, which means if you had the technology, not to mention the testes, in theory, you could travel back and forth from the past to the future, and all points in between. The class applauds his performance. Samantha is obviously flustered. It's impossible. Al smiles, rebuking her comment with the words of A.A. A. Milton. Time is swift. It races by. Opportunities are born and die. Still you wait and will not try a bird with wings who dares not fly. And as she stares back at Al with all the uncertainty of someone her, her age, her. and then some, the bell rings. Students immediately begin to rise and exit. Samantha still staring blankly at Al as he gathers his things to go as well. Samantha, Sam, you okay? He finally snaps to. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry. Let's go. University Plaza. A young, the young couple exit with the others. Why, why do you subject yourself to that kind of punishment? Because I don't have a choice. His suggestions about time travel are crazy. Right. Can't wait to see how you react to my suggestion. What suggestion? Well, look, before you get all worked up, just remember, I, I'm not talking about time travel, okay? All I did was buy us two tickets to Europe. Gerard. Well, we talked about this. I know, I know, but come on, Sam. Graduation's right around the corner. I, I want us to celebrate together. What if I'm not ready? For what? Celebrating? No. Graduating. Samantha, please. Samantha, please. You're already the youngest person at MIT to have three degrees under your belt. Psychology, chemistry, and, and now we're days away from physics. Enough already. She looks at him sheepishly. Oh my God, you did it, didn't you? Look, I mean, look, I told you I might apply for the history department. I didn't, just didn't expect them to accept so soon. Hurt, he shakes his head and begins to walk away. Oh, come on, Gerard, wait, look, I didn't say that I'd accepted. Tell me you won't. Tell me you'll come with me on this trip. Well, I, I'm just not sure I'm ready. Gerard looks her right in the eyes. It's ultimatum time. Sam, I love you. But if you decide to stick around here for another degree in history, 
you might as well go ahead and add us to your studies. She stares back at him, uncertain what to say. So he says it for her by simply walking away. Gerard, look, look, I just need more time. You sure about that? Samantha turns to find Al beside her. Her face falls even further as she prepares for yet another confrontation. Professor Calavici. Al watches Gerard cross the plaza. Sometimes you can have all the time in the world and still feel lost. Like if this is about class. I wish it were that simple. Believe me, nobody knows better than I do that quantum physics is an inexact science. Well, maybe one other guy. Anyway, a little spirited debate is always good for the soul. As she sees Gerard finally disappear into the crowd. Not so sure about that. You're still young. You'll learn. Speaking of, I hear you've been offered another scholarship. History. Full ride. It's pretty impressive. But before you go delving too far into the past on your own, can I show you something? She looks at him quizzically as we... University physical in, uh, plant moments later, establishing your basic campus power facility, a place no student would ever have any reason to visit. Interior physical plant. Uh, but there goes Samantha, following Al past a university security guard posted just outside the entrance of the industrial space. Professor? Eddie, here's that poker money I owe you. Al slips the guard a few bills, but the guard only grins. You owe me a heck of a lot more than that. Al winks at him as he leads Sam into an elevator. Yeah, I put it on my tab. The door clo oh, elevator. The door closes, leaving Al and Samantha alone once more, a beat of silence, and then she turns to him for directions. Oh, sorry, I just hit the uh, down button. Angle the elevator buttons. There is no down button, just one, just three buttons mark one, two, three, Samantha frowns. There is no down button. Oh, right. He nonchalantly reaches toward the panel and then rapidly presses all three buttons in a complex combination. Suddenly, the elevator lurches downward. Lesson number one. Lesson number one, things are rarely as they may seem. The elevator slows to a halt. And just as Samantha begins to wonder what she's gotten herself into, angle in the door, the door opens to reveal Project Quantum Leap. Al ushers Samantha into the secret underground space floor to ceiling with high tech gear. Whereas the original PQL was built with clean and futuristic lines on the government's dime, this room is more like the do-it-yourself Radio Shack version, which actually only makes it more impressive. Samantha looks around dumbfounded. What is this place? Pretty nice, eh? Some might say it's a little more cramped than the old digs, but we like to think of it as cozy. We? Me and Gup. Guppy! Angle on a console, some kind of hardwired hybrid between a mixed board and a magnetic resonance imaging system. All you need to know is it's hard, especially when you're working underneath it and someone surprises you by calling your name. Wham! A young... Grad student bumps his head hard beneath the console. Sheldon Gupta, Guppy, immediately grips his scalp in pain. Ow! Over here, Professor. I was just trying to re-solder these capacitors on the hasboards. From under the console, he first sees Al's leg walk into view. Then he sees a much cuter pair of accompanying them. The diminutive lab tech climbs out of the tight space only to see Samantha. He's probably excited to see anyone down here besides Al, but he's also immediately, if not shyly, smitten by her. Oh, wow. It's you. I'm sorry. Have we met? Samantha Fuller, this is Sheldon Gupta. He wasn't crazy about Shelly for a nickname, nickname, so I call him Guppy for short. Well, that and because he's short. <laughs> Guppy humbly extends a hand to Samantha. I heard a lot about you. Samantha frowns at Al. I told him you're always thinking. 
Fortunately, he is too. God knows I never have been able to put this puzzle together without a bona fide computer genius like Guppy. I just did it for extra credit. I'm sorry, did what? What is it that you guys are doing down here? Well, to tell you the truth, we haven't done it yet. That's where you come in. Oh, look, if this is one of those cam hidden camera shows where you guys are going to goof <laughs> on me for cash or prizes, I... May 29th, 1992. Jeez. I can't believe it's been that long since I first heard you say that. You were only 12 years old playing against the shooting stars in the Youth League Finals. You even scored a couple of goals yourself, if I recall. But that's not what you remember most about that game, now is it, Samantha? To say Samantha looks rattled would be an understatement. How do you know about that? Because I was there when Hollis Hansen approached you on the field. In the crowd? Holographically speaking? I never understood why he came. Well, you couldn't have. It would have made even less sense to you then than it probably does now. But the fact is, that wasn't Hollis Hansen you were talking to, Samantha. It wasn't. No. It was your father. Her face hardens. My father. Well, not exactly. Okay. Well, then you have exactly two minutes to tell me what the hell you're talking about before I take the elevator back out of your little top secret bat cave and make an appointment to see the dean. Al sighs, nods at Guppy, who checks his watch and hits a series of buttons at the console. Monitors beside them come to life with archival footage of Sam in the early days of the PQL experiment. In 1982, a brilliant scientist named Dr. Samuel Beckett published a paper on the theoretical mechanics of traveling through time. Only the paper wasn't actually published because the United States government secretly confiscated it for reasons of, of national security. But after extensive meetings with Dr. Beckett, they chose, in a closed-door session of Congress, to covertly fund the testing of his theories in a specially constructed laboratory beneath the New Mexico desert called Project Quantum Leap. How am I doing? A minute Got 45. <laughs> anyway, you just wasted like 15 of my seconds. <laughs> Sorry, Al. <laughs> anyway, I was assigned to help Sam facilitate the experiment, which between you and me, I never really thought would work either. But just like you, I was dead wrong. Unfortunately, Sam got a bit carried away with his own success and decided to try it out himself before all the kinks had been worked out. On the monitors, we see Sam's body being bombarded by leap light for the first time in the accelerator chamber. Kink number one, Sam never traveled through time as himself, but instead leapt into the bodies of other people who lived somewhere during his natural lifespan. And those poor folks were simultaneously sent to our waiting room in New Mexico, where most of them swore they'd never drink tequila again. On the monitors, we see a plethora of images of Sam leaping into assorted people. He's a test pilot in the cockpit of an X-2, a Southern Bell in drag, a baseball star at bat, a rock star on stage, a black man living in a small white town. That is, until Sam somehow managed to figure out a way to help them in their lives, which subsequently allowed them to return. Kink number two, it wasn't as easy for Sam himself to return as we'd originally hoped. So I basically spent the next 20 some odd years following him around in holographic form and trying to help as best I could. 30 seconds. On the monitors, footage of the final trilogy episode began to troll, giving us a first glimpse of Samantha's mother and Sam as her attorney. And during one of his leaps, Sam got a bit carried away during his time as an attorney and fell in love with his client. One thing led to another, then down went the briefs, and nine months later, you were born. <laughs> Only by that point, Sam had already leapt on, and the attorney returned with a pretty lousy hangover. He said he traveled through time. They said he was nuts. On the monitors, in a final fury of images, first we see surveillance shots of Samantha's father being wheeled into an institution. Then we, still, <clears throat> then we see still frames of bogus talk shows, guests with titles supered over them like real life close encounters or I was an alien love slave. And finally, we see a series of shots of military vehicles and personnel shutting down PQL's original desert laboratory. Well, he kind of was. 
But if it makes you feel any better after that, we started telling people they were abducted by aliens anyway. And then when they all started doing the talk shows, we just started knocking them out with laughing gas. Like I said, it's an inexact science, which is why kink number three, the powers that be suddenly pulled the plug when we least expected it, leaving Sam just enough time to come see you before he was forced to go leaping off somewhere into the cold blue yonder without so much as a pre-printed thank you note from the president. And time's up. You weren't messing with people's lives. We were making them better. Who asked you to? People don't always ask for help when they need it. My father has been in a mental institution all of my life. Because he needed help more than most, Samantha. According to medical records, your dad was suffering from a chemical imbalance and would have wound up there anyway. But even if he'd somehow beat the odds, you wouldn't have been born to stand here casting judgment if Sam hadn't fallen in love with your mom first. I see. So assuming I choose to believe any part of this nonsense, uh, what the hell am I supposed to do with it? Al hands her a computer disc, the cover of which reads Practical Mechanics of Time Travel by Dr. Samuel Beckett, property of U.S. government classified. Read it. You should find it pretty illuminating. After all, you have a lot more in common with Dr. Beckett than you think. You're both smart. You're both stubborn, and you both have a habit of starting things that are very difficult to finish. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go now. Samantha Brutley takes the disc and crosses to the elevator. I need your help, Samantha. Think of it as a leap of faith. I know we can find him if we just work together. Interior elevator. She steps in and turns around only to see Al looking at her with a genuine urgency in his face. Why should I care about any of this? Because all the history classes in the world aren't going to fill in the blanks on your past or ever make sense of your present. The Much elevator's give... door closes and she's gone. The camera holds on Al. Much less give Sam a chance at a future. Campus movie theater, night. Under dark and cloudy skies, Samantha pours over her laptop on a park bench, flabbergasted by Sam Beckett's brilliance as she finishes reading the last page of his treatise of time travel. She closes the computer, then shoves it in a bag and crosses to a payphone outside a small art house cinema. The movie marquee behind her reads, now playing Things to Come. Angle on the phone as Samantha cheer... Leslie dials a number, a couple of rings, and a woman, sleepy voice, finally answers. Hello? Uh, Mom, it's me. Samantha, it's late there. Is everything okay? Yeah, Mom, no, everything's okay. Uh, <clears throat> can I just, can I ask you something? Sure. Uh, have you d talked to Dad lately? Mom? Why are you asking me that question? I don't know. It's just that uh, I've been thinking about him, that's all. Honey, you don't even know your father. And I haven't spoken to him in years. He's a very sick man. Samantha feels the first sprinkle of rain fall on her face. The pavement around her feet begins to darken. Her eyes search through the letters on the marquee for answers, things to come. Are you sure? Samantha, if you just woke me up to argue over your father's mental state, then I'm going to go back to sleep. I've got to be at work early in the morning. And no, I know. I <clears throat> Sorry, Mom. It's starting to rain anyway. I gotta go. I love you. She hangs up just as the rain really begins to fall. And in a bad need of cover, she ducks inside the movie theater. The movie theater. As Samantha makes her way down the dark aisle of the theater, a sparse crowd watches the black and white sci-fi classic version of H.G. Wells' Things to Come. She takes a seat by herself as, on the screen, two deco-clad denizens of utopia discuss the virtues of the past versus the future. 
It is a better world than it used to be. Machines and marvels. They built this great city of theirs. Yes. They prolonged life. Yes. It is it a jollier than the world used to be in the old days? All the same, what can we do about it? Rebel. Now. Now is the time. Tears of uncertainty quietly spill down Samantha's cheeks. Then someone suddenly sits down beside her. It's Al with a box of popcorn in one hand and a box of Kleenex in the other. Here, I thought, you'd, I thought you could use these. Of course, if I would have known how hokey this picture was, I would have brought you some earplugs too. She wipes her eyes with a tissue. After a beat later, she finally takes her eyes off the screen, looking right at Al. I'll do it. Oh, sorry. Looking right at Al. I'll do it. You'll leap? Yes. But not for you. Or the doctor or either one of my fathers, for that matter. Then why? Because I want some good old days of my own. She gets up to leave the theater, and Al follows after her. The camera lingers on the screen as Raymond Massey sums it up. And what shall be said of the citizen of tomorrow, when he has conquered all the deeps of space and all the mysteries of time, still he will be beginning. Ooh. Fade out. End of act two. Ooh. It's just so surreal to hear Great. Ziggy <laughs> reading a new Quantum Leap story to me. <laughs> wow. I'm really into this. I'm, you guys are great. I'm getting sucked in. So... So fun. Hey guys, this is Damon, Mike, Brian, and MJ from the Fandom Entanglement Quantum Leap Podcast, and we want to wish all of you a happy Leap Day. As you continue to enjoy the reading of A Bold Leap Forward with Trey Calloway and the stars of Quantum Leap, we want to direct you to the GoFundMe page to benefit the family of Matt Dale, our friend who passed away sadly in December. You can visit the fundraiser by scanning the QR code on your screen. Any donation is appreciated. Matt was a really good friend to so many of us, and I think that he would be blown away by the generosity of Leapers around the world and by the Quantum Leap television series team who have supported and remembered him and his family through this difficult time. If you don't have Matt's amazing books, you can still get uh, Beyond the Mirror Image, Volumes 1 and 2 at the link below or by searching online. And you can enjoy his extensive podcasts and interviews at quantumleappodcast.com. Congratulations to the cast and crew of Quantum Leap on a great ending to season two. Matt would surely have enjoyed it. Donate to the GoFundMe if you can. And remember, Leap Day, day, day is, is Matt, Matt day. day. So we are heading into act three. Uh, and uh, Trey will uh, resume narrating for this act. All right, here we go. Act three, interior Project Quantum Leap. It's night and Samantha is back in the lab getting briefed by Al and Guppy. Uh, so wherever I go, you'll be with me. Yes and no. I'll be projecting myself holographically from the imaging chamber. So only you will see me. Well. You and some kids in clairvoyance, but that's just design floor. We can't seem to get around. We have managed to improve Ziggy, though. Ziggy? Al pulls Ziggy out of his pocket and hands it to her for closer inspection. Angle on Ziggy, a much more sleek and streamlined version of the original, <laughs> in the most dated line in the script, think iPod, <laughs> an American <laughs> blue card. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> communications and computer database we can use to help fill in a few of the blanks when you leap. It's also the reason I should have been filthy rich until Uncle Sam got greedy and claimed it as a proprietary technology. And next thing you know, boom, the internet, cell phones, PDAs, hell, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, and even that dude from Dell would have been working for me by now. <laughs> <laughs> I digress. You were saying, Gup. The latest version of Ziggy also includes the POP extension. Probability outcome projection. It should help calculate various possible outcomes of any move you make according to historical and statistical analysis. Pretty impressive for a credit card. So what are the chances that I'll lose this on the first leap? Zero. Ziggy stays with me. We do have a little something for you to take along, though. Guppy hands are what appears to be a timelessly elegant looking watch. 
a watch? What is this, a going away present? More like a coming back present. It's a portable accelerator. Angle on the watch as he opens the face to reveal a sense of touch button and a small digital date time lat long readout. Think of it as an eject button. Press it once during any leap, and if we've done our homework, it should get you back here to PQL before you can say, osmium case with a diamond face and a hundred times more expensive than Rolex. <laughs> That's the PA on. It's a perfect fit. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> ah. uh, cool. So whenever you or this little experiment of yours starts to get on my nerves, I can just leap back to class. I said once. The PA is only good for a single use. So if you happen to use it before you track down Dr. Beckett, all bets are off. He's gone. Until you buy another watch. We didn't <laughs> buy it. We built it. And it took me 10 years just to scrape together the plutonium for that one without getting arrested or attacked by a coalition of the willing. So don't. I repeat, do not press eject until the ride has come to a full and complete stop. And when is that? Every time you put someone's life right, you take another leap. And every time you leap, Guppy here will be on the lookout for Dr. Beckett. Then if our calculations are correct and we can bring you two together, we could use the same button to send you both back. Sounds easy as pie. Oh yeah, 3.146, et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> so on and so forth. The mainframe accelerator's ready. Thanks, Gup. How about you? Oh, I said I was, didn't I? All right then, young lady, step right up. Angle on the mainframe accelerator, a launch pad of sorts from which our willing young subject will make her first leap. It's immediately adjacent to a glass booth called the waiting room. Here's where you'll leap from. And whoever you land in, you'll will wind up in the waiting room next door. Then he or she will have a nice nap until you're finished. Sound simple enough? Okay, just shut up and push me off the edge before I change my mind, Professor. Call me out. And call me anytime you need me. Initiating leap sequence. Don't move. This shouldn't hurt a bit. Al crosses his fingers and moves away from the accelerator platform, crossing into an adjacent imaging chamber. And as he enters, his body is scanned from every conceivable angle by a complex laser grid beaming info back to sensors. He glances through a window at Guppy behind the main console. All systems check and go. All vitals normal. Angle on a thermographic body scan of Samantha on a monitor. Leave commencing in five seconds. Al looks over at her standing anxiously on the pad. He has waited a long time for this moment. Four, three. Samantha catches Al's gaze. She never saw this moment coming. Two, one. See you around, kid. He slips on a view met, an ergonomic helmet which covers his eyes to allow a 360 degree view of Samantha's leap locale. If I can find the time. A brilliant burst of light begins to emanate from Samantha's core and then, like the nucleus of an imploding atom, she suddenly disappears in a blinding flash and we leap to Exterior JFK Stadium, Philadelphia Day. In the background, a giant sports stadium alive on the inside with over 100,000 people. A super reads July 13th, 1985. In the parking lot outside, tens of thousands of cars and at least one weirded out young woman. Camera widens to reveal Samantha standing in the parking lot. Ow. Ow. Who, who the hell is Al? Samantha turns around to see Russ Corbin, a mullet-headed loser in a Styx t-shirt. Flanked by his tailgating buddies Dugan and Snap, Russ downs the rest of his beer and belches. Uh, you ain't stepping out on me, are you, Claire? He crunches the can against his head for extra emphasis. Samantha glances to one side, suddenly spotting herself in the side view mirror of a van. Only it's not her own reflection, she sees. Instead, Sam is staring back at Claire Plummer, the wide-eyed, fair-skinned, 19-year-old she's just leapt into. This is the strangest sensation imaginable. Uh, no. Uh, sorry, I just th I thought I saw someone I knew. That's all. Well, try not to fog up them windows gawking at yourself. I just had her detailed. Samantha <laughs> stepped back to behold Russ's pride and joy, a Ford van custom painted with Pac-Man video game characters <laughs> gobbling assorted fruit down its black length. License plate, P-18. 
pack van. <laughs> Where am I? Al's reflection suddenly steps into view beside Claire's. You're in the parking lot of JFK Stadium in Philadelphia. Why? Good question. Most people are inside having the time of their lives. Watching what? Live Aid. And just to attest to the excitement, a roar of the crowd rises up from a stadium in the distance. Samantha cannot help but grin. This is just too cool. No way. 60 of the world's biggest acts playing 17 minutes each on two stages in the U.S. and U.K. Raised $100 million for charity in only one day. Russ ignorantly walks right through Al's image, proudly putting a tattooed arm around her. Bitching, ain't it? He suddenly pulls her in for a deep, nasty kiss, and all Al can do is turn his back. Oh, God, these were ugly. Samantha squirms in Russ's arms like he's Pepe Le Pew until she's finally able to shove him off with disgust, momentarily forgetting the role she's clearly here to play. Ugh, okay, get your, your tongue off of me. Dugan and Snap snicker at her refusal, embarrassing Russ further. Damn, baby. How many beers have you had? <laughs> your name is Claire Plummer. His name is Russ Corbin. You're 19. He's 26. He's been your boyfriend for eight months. And Ziggy has no clue how many brews he's had at this point. So you better think of something fast. Huh? Uh, no, no. I just meant if you're going to touch me, you better get ready to dance. <laughs> I mean, we are live aid, right? Russ's hardened face finally cracks into a stupid grin. Totally. Snap. Dugan. Crank up the tunes. They dutifully turn up a boombox and one thing leads to another by the fix begins. Then, to make matters worse, Russ begins to move and it is the most shameful display of 80s dancing you have ever seen. This just, this isn't happening. What? You want another song? I think we got some journey in the van. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, um, uh, but why are we stuck out here in the parking lot when the show's going on inside? Hello, Claire. You know how expensive tickets were? They were like 19 bucks each. <laughs> how do you think they, how much do you think they pay me at the plant anyway? Duh. <laughs> and, and anyway, they were like totally impossible to get. Duh. Duh. <laughs> Dugan turns the box back down in a buzz-killing protest. Right. Sorry. Duh. <laughs> I'm going to get another beer. But before he can... Spare ticket! Anybody need a spare ticket? All eyes turn to see Jesse Faulkner, age 18, good-looking in an honest way. But never mind all that. He's got a ticket. Russ drops his beer and bolts toward Jesse. Dude, you got a ticket? The, that's what I said. How much? Face value. I'm not trying to make any money. Just want to get rid of it. I'll take it. But Snap and Dugan have other ideas. I'll give you 20 for it. Are you busting on me? 25. Guys, I already told you. 50. I'll give you 50 bucks. I thought you said... Shut up, babe. <laughs> Excuse me? Just give me the damn ticket. Nah, give it to me. Well, with that, it's mine. But Russ, that is is through talking. but Russ is through talking, so instead, he starts pummeling. And Samantha and Jesse have just enough time to jump out of the way before the fists start to fly in three directions. Angle on a car as Jesse and Samantha duck. What's with these guys? They're morons. <laughs> I said I wasn't looking for money. I just wanted somebody to enjoy it. How'd you end up with an extra ticket in the first place? Jesse looks away from the mullet head melee. You really want to know? This ticket was supposed to be my girlfriend's until she broke up with me this morning. Why? She was all bummed that Michael Jackson wasn't playing. Wait, that's why she dumped you? Hey, I'm clearly not the only one who dates the wrong people. Angle on the fight, which only gets uglier as Dugan slams Snap's head into the side of Russ's treasured van and Russ <laughs> goes postal on Dugan. Two shots. How serious are you in the Neanderthal? Eyes on Ziggy. Al offers her an over-the-shoulder pointer. According to Ziggy, Russ is going to propose to you in two days. <sighs> Seems pretty serious. Yeah, I can see that. You can also see there's an unspoken chemistry between them. So what's your name anyway? 
She momentarily blanks, but Al clears his throat on cue. <clears throat> Claire. 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 Claire Plummer. Well, nice to meet you, Claire Plummer. I'm Jesse Faulkner. You know, it looks like they may be in it for a while. Would you like to take my spare ticket? Me? Yeah, I'd love to. Here. Uh, but I, I don't think I have any money. That's all right. You can have it as long as you promise to enjoy it. But before he can hand it to her, woo, a police siren bleats loudly as a squad car pulls up and two cops jump out to break up the fight. Whoops. Flag on the play. Oh, no. She rises, stepping around the car to see one cop wrestle Russ to the ground and cuff him as the other does the same to Dugan. Poor Snap still out cold beneath the dented van. Bruised and bloody, Russ spots Samantha from the pavement. Baby, baby, tell him it wasn't my fault. Yeah, save it for his trial. And with that, the cops shove Russ and Dugan both into the back of their car, then cuff and drape Snap across their laps. They slam the door and whisk the brawlers away, and only then does Samantha think to look back. But Jesse isn't there. He's gone. You shouldn't have let him go. I didn't have a choice. They arrested him. Not Meathead, the other guy. Jesse? But I thought you said Russ was going to propose. Yeah, in a courtroom during a sentencing hearing over violating the terms of his parole. Wait, you mean he's going to jail before? Prison, actually. Grand theft auto, assault, and battery. Oh, and look at that. He even robbed a barber shop. Should have had them shave that mullet while he was at it. <laughs> I can't believe it. It gets worse. Tomorrow night after you convince Claire's parents to post his bail, he's going to thank them by getting you pregnant in the backseat of the pack van. <laughs> what? Yeah, that's right. While he's locked up, you'll be knocked up. <laughs> uh, no, okay. No, we. you've got to help me. Her. Out. Uh, out. What are we supposed to do? We could try running that SOS through a little POP. Al retrieves Ziggy and puts its probability outcome projection software to the test. He enters Jesse's name into the database and then... Oh. Oh, what? According to probability outcome projection, your best ticket would have been to take that ticket. Ziggy puts Claire's chances of enjoying the concert, falling in love with Jesse, going to college, getting married, and then actually traveling to Africa to feed starving children yourself. That is when you're not too busy feeding your own at just shy of 98%. Great. Just great. So the love of Claire's life has just walked away and I couldn't even find him if I wanted to. Why? Because I haven't got a ticket. <laughs> Who says you need a ticket? And off his devious look, we fade out at the end of act three. Ooh. I'm loving it. And all I can remember is my rock and mullet when I was a teenager in the 80s. You were, Thank you, Trey. You were not alone, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Ironically, they are back in these days. Yes, they are. So. <laughs> no, no, that. don't say that. Crazy. They're not it's, back in. It's, a, it's all <laughs> business in the front and party in the back. All right, we're going to Act <laughs> 4. Duh. Again, if you're enjoying this, remember to click that link below, scan the QR code, and uh, donate to the GoFundMe site to help support Matt's family. We are back with Trey as the narrator. Top of Act 4, we're still outside of exterior at JFK Stadium. Samantha is now in line to pass through the gate. She's got a discarded ticket stub in her hand, and Al is standing right beside her. This isn't going to work out. You said the same thing about time travel. Yeah, but I've only done that once. So far, I've tried and failed to pass through these gates three different times. It's Samantha's turn at the turnstile, so she abruptly puts on her cutest smile and hands over the stub, trying her very best to distract a tired-looking attendant. Hi, how are you today? Isn't this like a wonderful concert for a worthy cause? Don't you think everyone should do their part to end the famine? The attendant looks up at her completely unenthused. I sure do, but I also think everyone should have a ticket to see the show. Next. Samantha <laughs> turns away from the gates once more. You see, I told you, they don't even have metal detectors and strip searches yet, and it is still impossible to crash this party. Al suddenly focuses on the backside of the stadium. Come on, desperate times require desperate measures. Outside the stadium, in an aerial view, a human tide of music fans cheer with emotional appreciation as another act takes the stage. The camera cranes slowly down, passing the tops of several trees which ring the stadium, descending further along the trunk of one in particular until we find Samantha and Al still on the ground outside. 
You want me to climb a tree? Those branches are crossing the wall. Yeah, almost 15 feet up. What am I supposed to do then? Flap my wings and land on the other side? <laughs> You'd rather be showing Russ's baby pictures through bulletproof glass? She sighs, then starts <laughs> climbing. Outside the treetop, Samantha finally climbs up into frame among the tree's densely leaved branches, and then she gets her first up-close view. From Samantha's POV, we see that she is overlooking a VIP backstage area, but just above the tents and the porta-potties, we can also see the crowd stretching back forever. Oh, my God. There's got to be 100,000 people out there. Al pipes up from a nearby branch. 162. 1.9 billion if you count the TV audience. Ready to join the crowd? Ow. Oh. Dumpster, six o'clock. Samantha follows his gaze down to the other side of the wall where an overflowing trash dumpster sits. And then she eyes the classic 80s clothing she's wearing on loan from Claire. <laughs> oh, I never liked acid wash jeans anyway. And she jumps and lands right in the trash heap, quickly scrambling over the edge and dropping down to the ground beside it, escaping notice. Angle on the stadium wall as Al walks right through to join her. There. Wasn't that easy? <laughs> Speak for yourself. Hey, all you got to do now is find Jesse and you're home free. All right, come on, Al. You saw the size of that crowd. I mean, sorry. <clears throat> oh, come on, Al. You saw the size of that crowd. There's no way I will ever be able to find him out there. His attention is suddenly distracted by something behind her. She turns, following his gaze, to a set of stairs which lead up from the back to the stage. A bouncer is stationed at the bottom, making sure every artist has a stage pass dangling from his or her neck before they touch those stairs. No. Uh-uh. There is absolutely no way I am going up. Oh my God, that is Mick Jagger. <laughs> from behind, we see a big-lipped look-alike cross out of a stage adjacent tent. Same 80s linen suit and Jagger swagger with a stage pass swinging from his neck. Damn, he even looked ancient back then. Jagger <laughs> heads straight for a row of porta potties. Look, he's going to the John. Well, even rock stars got a sh. She abruptly walks <laughs> away in that direction. Hey, where are you going? Samantha is a woman on a mission. Outside the porta potty, moments later, Sam steps around beside the latrine where several empty wine crates have been discarded. She looks up at the top of the latrine where a sliding plastic vent can be opened or closed. As Al reappears beside her, she's already stacking up the wine crates so she can reach that vent. Are you crazy? This is no time for an autograph, especially not here. I am not interested in an autograph. I am interested in keeping Claire's life on track. You were right. The only way I can possibly do that at this point is if I get myself on stage. When did I say you should go on stage? You didn't, but you didn't say, you did say that desperate times require desperate measures. And with that, she reaches in through the vent. Inside, we hear Jagger's cockney protest. Hey, what the bloody hell? <laughs> Angle on the vent as Samantha abruptly yanks his stage pass out and throws it around her own neck. Sorry, Mick, but I need a little satisfaction of my own here. And then, as Al watches in astonishment, she picks up an unopened hefty case of wine and deposits it with a thud outside the porta potty's door, blocking Jagger's exit before she bolts. Hello? Hello? Outside a backstage area, as Samantha determinedly makes her way through a group of musicians toward the stage, Al struggles to keep up, much less comprehend what she's about to do. Sweetheart, I don't think you understand how this works. This job isn't about hogging the limelight. Well, it is today, Al. Angle on the stairs where Ozzy Osbourne stands beside the bouncer waiting to go on as Samantha approaches. Oh, hey, Ozzy, I was just thinking, after this, you and Sharon should have a few kids and then do your own TV show. <laughs> Ozzy looks back at her blankly for a beat and then, that's a great effing idea. <laughs> she flashes her pass at the bouncer who nods as she passes them both on the stairs and continues toward the main stage where, God bless him, Rick Springfield is just about to launch into a 17-minute set before the largest crowd of his 80s hit-making career. That is, until Samantha suddenly interrupts him. Ah, uh, forgive me, Rick. I am really sorry to do this. I even used to have one of your posters on my bedroom wall, but I really need to borrow your mic for a second. What? Uh, trust me, you'll all be out of work for a while as soon as this whole grunge scene hits, but don't worry, the uh, 80s are going to make a huge comeback. Rick steps aside, confused, and Samantha grabs the mic. Okay. Hello? Uh, can I have your attention, please? I don't mean to interrupt. 
Uh, but is there a Jesse Faulkner out there? I, I I need a Jesse Faulkner to come to the stage immediately, please. In the crowd, in the crowd, Jesse suddenly looks up, completely stunned to hear his name. And then when he sees who's calling it, all he can do is start pushing his way through the crowd. Yo, over here! I'm over here. <laughs> Once again, from behind, we see a very angry Jagger bawling out the bouncer backstage, who then obediently heads up the stairs. And on the stage, Samantha keeps scanning the crowd. Wait, Jesse? Jesse, are you there? But when she spies the furious bouncer making a beeline in her direction, things are definitely not looking good until Jesse suddenly calls out from the front row. Claire! Here, I'm right here! <laughs> the bouncer approaches Samantha. Can you come with me, please? He, Wait, I am. Um, I just. He takes Jagger's pass back from around her neck and grabs her by the arm. No, you wormed your way up here on someone else's pass. Probably don't even have a ticket. Jesse waves his spare ticket in the air. Yeah, she does. It's right here. The bouncer <laughs> hesitates just long enough for the crowd to roar with support around them. Look, even Rick Springfield seems cool with it. Just let her go, man. So once more, the bouncer immediately <laughs> obliges the talent. Go. And before he can change his mind, Samantha slips off the edge of the stage where she immediately rushes to Jesse's side. <sighs> Boy, am I glad to find you. Girl, you are not the only one. They embrace, and as a cheer rises up from the crowd, Rick Springfield appropriately kicks his band into a rousing version of Jesse's girl. Angle on out. <laughs> Proudly tapping his foot in the wings <laughs> as Angle on Jesse and Samantha, they dance on the front row until she starts happily jumping back and forth. What are you doing? It's called moshing! <laughs> Mo moshing? Cool! He follows her lead along with a crowd of other eager spectators and as Springfield launches into another power pop chorus, a familiar burst of blue light suddenly radiates from Samantha once more and a beat later, she disappears in a sudden blinding flash and we leap to the inside of a security office in the evening. Samantha abruptly finds herself in a small office staring right across a cluttered desk at yet another security guard. But this middle-aged gentleman doesn't look nearly as forgiving as the one who just let her gracefully leave the stage at Live Aid. In fact, according to the name played on his desk, this is the boss man, Ted Archer, director of security. If she oh. takes one look at Archer's disenchanted glare and erroneously decides this must be all about Live Aid. Oh, okay, uh, look. I'm sorry. I can explain. I mean, I don't, don't get me wrong. I've always kind of liked the stones, but <laughs> we're not here to discuss your taste in music. No, no. Fine. You want to be more formal about this? That's okay by me. Muhammad. Allah knows I'm going to have to fill out a ream of paperwork just to get you out of here. Samantha looks down at herself, noticing for the first time that her clothes have changed. Apparently, she too is now dressed like a security guard. Polyester shirt with epaulets, matching slacks with a belt containing a club, pepper spray, and a service revolver. She even reaches up, removing a hat, which reads security. Where the hell is she? Uh, I don't understand. Well, that's the problem in a nutshell. You've been working security here for how long now? Six years? And all I can say is you just don't get it. Get what? That part of being a security guard is making people feel secure. Only you, you just seem dead set on scaring the hell out of folks every chance you get. How uh, so? Checking IDs, crawling under people's cars for a visual inspection. Jeez, I thought that lady on 34 was gonna tear my head off yesterday after you emptied her briefcase check for suspicious objects. Uh, I'm sorry. Save but your breath, Bishani. I appreciate everything you went through here with when you first started, I, I really do. But with all due respect, I think it cracked a few of your windows, if you know what I'm saying. So I just think it would be best for all of us if we let you go. Maybe uh, you can get some help. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that would be a good idea. I'm glad you feel that way. I know we do. Samantha stares at Archer blankly for a beat, wondering exactly what she's supposed to do next. I'm going to need your hat, badge, and belt. Samantha glances down at her uniform. Oh. She sets her hat on the desk, removes a badge from her shirt, and then deposits her belt on Archer's desk. 
No hard feelings, Mo. And for what it's worth, this isn't a, uh, you know, cultural thing. Thanks. I think. She walks out of his office, having just been fired for the first time in her life. Inside a public restroom a few moments later, Samantha slowly walks into a men's room, finally stopping to look at herself in the mirror. But this time, the reflection she beholds belongs to Mohammed Bashani, a 48-year-old Pakistani man and now unemployed security guard. Hello. Oh, I'm not sure where I am or who you are, but I'm afraid you just got sacked. Al steps into view beside her, a very troubled look on his face. I'm going to do my best to fill you in on that one, Samantha, but I think we should step outside. And we cut to an exterior plaza moments later. Samantha and Al pass through a revolving glass door and begin to cross a wide plaza. What a drag. If it's all the same to you, I would have much rather stayed at Live Aid to watch the Sting show than up here and get stung. I feel the same way. What's wrong? Everything. Al, are you okay? Al shakes his head, gesturing back over his shoulder in the direction they've just come from. No, nobody is. And then, for the first time, Samantha looks back to see the gargantuan skyscraper she's just exited, which just happens to have an identical building just across the plaza from it. And for a brief, sickening second, all of the air leaves Samantha's lungs. Oh my God. Angle on the twin towers of the World Trade Center in New York City, a super finally appears reading September 10, 2001. We fade out at the end of Act Four. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. Hey guys, David Stacey from the Core Productions Deep Dive TV podcast here, and we want to wish you all a happy Leap Day. And as you continue on your time travel adventures today, we want to remind you about the GoFundMe campaign that is currently running to raise money for the family of Matt Dale during this very difficult time for them. You can access the fundraiser by scanning the QR code on your screen and any donation is greatly appreciated. Yeah, and the season two finale of Quantum Leap was absolutely amazing. It definitely was. And um, it's just so heartbreaking that Matt, you know, isn't able to watch that and to see how the whole season came together and um, to write about it in his Beyond the Mirror Image book series. And I want you all to remember, while time travel is still fiction, each and every one of us has the power to make positive changes around the world. And remember, Leap, Leap Day, Day is, is Matt Day. Day. You should just play us. Do this. It was really interesting right. to read this just because I read Al as Dean. I was like, oh, wow. That's Dean. Like, I, I was like, oh, I hear it. Like, that's for Dean. Yeah. It's for written. sure. It's so cool. That's why I'm just reading the words because I was like, it's Al. I'm not, you know, it's it's Al. I'm not like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is Al. Okay. <laughs> Gigantic. What is it? Like grapefruit balls or something later? Whatever. Anyway. Well, the brief, the, the testes, and then the briefs went down and half a month later. No, my favorite line is, oh, now I've forgotten it. That was one that I just thought was gold. Anyways, it's awesome. Let's all I'll shut yeah, up. Yeah, let's keep going. Yeah. All right. We are opening up on Act 5. Thanks for everybody for sticking with us. We are about two-thirds of the way through. Remember, if you haven't already, please click on the link for the GoFundMe campaign to support Matt. Matt's, to support Matt's family, his his partner and his son who have survived him. Um, How's it going? Deborah, How, are we have... we, uh, is it working? Are people contributing? <laughs> it's not live. Oh. <laughs> It's not live yet. Oh, shoot. We're going to be releasing we're, this we're on Leap Day. We're posting it as live. But... We're going to be posting it as live. Don't worry about it. It's all right. Like I said, I'm in tomorrow in another world. I'm sure. I'm sure it's going to be. I'm sure it's going to be gangbusters yeah. with an all star cast like this to attract the the eyeballs. So absolutely, it's it's going to go great because you're here. All right, uh, Deborah, you will act as narrator again for this act. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, World Trade Center Plaza evening. Samantha takes one horrified look at her watch. She sees the date for herself. 9-10-2001. No, Al, no, 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 no. This, this isn't possible. I'm afraid it is. Then this is our big chance. We can stop it. She immediately charges back across the plaza toward the South Tower and Al hates himself for trying to stop her. 
Samantha, wait. You can't. What do you mean I can't? What's the point of traveling through time if you can't fix it? Buffy and I have been running the numbers all afternoon. And even with all the possible permutations of this leap, somehow tomorrow's tragedy is still going to happen. Not on my watch. But it's not your watch, sweetheart. You've got to understand that. Right now, you're only borrowing someone else's life. Yeah, well, I may not have known him long, but I'm pretty sure he'd want me to do something worthwhile with it. She urgently shoves her way back through the revolving doors, leaving Al to stand alone outside the, and watch through one of the cathedral arch windows. Interior lobby continuous. A still employed member of the Trade Center security named Logan looks up from his behind the counter. Hey, Mo, I'm sorry about what happened, man, but I, I'm sure you're gonna land on your feet. No. no. Uh, Logan, something terrible is gonna happen tomorrow morning. Worse than terrible. A pure act of evil. You hear me? And both of these towers are going to fall to the ground. Behind the counter, Logan offers apologetic glances at people as they pass, then hits a silent panic button. Okay, Mo. Look, take it easy, all right? Why, why don't you just try and keep your voice down and we'll take a walk and talk about it. Logan rises, trying to lead Samantha back out, but she pulls away defensively. Okay, don't patronize me. Look, you don't understand. I I know what I'm talking about. I'm sure you do, Mo, but I promise you, we got the whole situation under control. A group of other security officers suddenly approaches, and Archer, the boss who just fired her, is one of them. She rushes toward him. No, Ted, please. Look, I know you just fired me, but thousands of people are going to die! That's some kind of threat? No, of course not. It's... No, it's not like that. Look, I am just trying to tell you that a group of terrorists are going to hijack two planes and ram them into the towers tomorrow if you don't give you your job back, right? Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't you give your relatives a call and tell them to book another flight back to wherever they came from and make sure they buy a seat for you while they're at it, all right? Angle on balcony above, where Al shakes his head in dismay. Angle on Samantha, double stung by Archer's racism is just the irony of it all. So she angrily grabs at his lapels, getting right in his face. I thought you said it wasn't a cultural thing. I thought I said you were fired. Archer suddenly pulls a taser out of his belt and gives Samantha a sharp joke with her, sending yeah. her writhing to the floor. Call the cops and haul this paranoid ass out of here. And as Al watches helplessly from above. Cut to the FBI New York work branch evening. A small task force of anti-terrorist agents are cloistered around a high security communication center as they monitor various forms of incoming intel on computers and surveillance monitors in the back foreground. In the background, camera finds a special agent, Ron Parks, visibly through a glass partition. Parks is on the phone scribbling info on a pad. A beat later, he hangs up and rejoins the subordinate agents in the bullpen. How's the chatter? Travis got a ream of information. Most of it's conflicting. Still coming in, sir. But it's not pointing us anywhere specific. Uh, I believe is Nan. Uh, Nan is sh is shut Nan, up. you're you're muted. I heard you talking, but not on here. Um. There we go. There you go. Still. Nope. No, you're good. Still coming in, sir. But it's not pointing us anywhere specific. Well, I just got a call from the head of security over at the Trade Center. Turns out he fired some employee of Middle Eastern descent, uh, Mohammed Bashani. Uh, evidently, the guy started making some crazy threats about an attack on the towers. You think it's legit? Again. I doubt it, but it's a lead. New York holding cell. PD holding cell. Samantha paces around a small cell. She shared with two other inmates, one a drunk who's half demented and the other a jonesing punk with a withdrawal inspired attitude. You okay, kid? Oh, and then there's Al. <laughs> you okay, kid? Who cares? Nobody. N nobody cares. He's right. Look, I've already told the whole sick story to three different cops, and I'm still stuck in here. Yeah, well, you're not alone, so shut the hell up, would you? I hate to agree with a punk, but you got to remember who you are. 
I'm Samantha Fuller. And and I'm Carol Channing. God almighty. (laughs) No, you're Muhammad Bashani, a poor guy who just moved to this country on his own and got in his first job working the graveyard shift at the Trade Center back when the first bomb went off back in 93. And God bless him. He was never quite the same after that. Would you be? Would I be what? Quiet. Of course not, Samantha. You can't very well expect anyone to believe the guy now. Hell, even if he was playing with a full deck, no one would believe him. On September 10th, we didn't see it coming, kid. Nobody did. Until it was too late. All right, so what am I supposed to do? Just sit around killing time until it kills 3,000 people in return? The drop trades a silent but disturbed look at the punk. Well, sorry, Mohammed Bashani. Samantha and Al turn to see an officer unlocking the cell door. You're free to go. That's it? You're just going to let me go without listening to a thing I have to say? Hey, if you really want to stay. Go, Sam. You're no good to anyone here. Okay, okay. I'm going. She exits the cell, and the officer relocks it behind her, leaving the drunk and the punk alone once more. I wish I had some of whatever the guy that I wish I had some of whatever that guy's been smoking. Who, Samantha? <laughs> and off the punk's threatening look at a cellmate, we cut to city streets. Moment later, Samantha angrily makes her way down a sidewalk. The trade center towers illuminated by the pastime against the night skyline behind her. You just need to figure out why you're here. That's all. It doesn't matter. Like you said yourself, I can't change time. No, I never said that. Look, this is hard to explain, but I'm going to try. If your father and I learned anything over the years, it was that if you want to make a big difference in people's lives, you have to focus on just that. The people. Okay, what do you think I'm trying to do? I didn't say all the people. I don't know why, Samantha, but for better or worse, some things are just supposed to happen. Even heartbreaking, horrific, unimaginable things. Every day. And when life gets completely overwhelming, there's only one thing left you can do. What? Al looks at her with years of hard-earned wisdom in his face. It's about the small stuff. Battery Park, moments later, camera finds a poster on a tree which displays a picture of a 17-year-old young man with the name Noah Linehan and the words lost. Please help, printed right above his handsome face. Samantha slowly crosses into frame, blocking our view of the poster to behold another view of her own. The harbor stretched out in the distance and out upon her island. The Statue of Liberty still up obliviously holds up a beacon of hope. Samantha soaks it in as tears form in her eyes. Al steps up beside her, then she glances at her watch. Angle on the watch, which reads 11.58 p.m., September 10th, 2001. I want to go home now. I know, kiddo. Angle on the watch again. We see Samantha flip up its face, exposing the portable accelerator controls. No, I mean it. Samantha, you can't. I know you told me you weren't doing this for me or Dr. Beckett or anyone else but yourself, but if you go, you can never come back, except in your memories, where you will always wonder what kind of difference, no matter how small, no matter how seemingly unrelated you might have made. A long beat of uncertainty, uh, silence passes between them, and then she turns, looking at the poster, tacked on the tree. Her eyes linger in the words, please help, at a phone number at the bottom. This park's going to be covered with missing posters just like this in about 24 hours. Al nods. That's true. But right now, there's only one. She swallows hard, wipes her tears, and takes the poster off the tree. She looks hard at the lost teenager's face, then at Al. Cut to... NYPD police precinct. Special Agent Parks leans angrily across the counter into the harried face of a desk clerk. What do you mean you let him go? Who do we have? Uh, Deborah, I had you as the clerk. Sorry. 
Oh, I was the clerk. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the narrator and the clerk just then. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, what do you mean? I mean, no one pressed charges. So we wrote him a ticket for disturbing the peace and sent him on his way. To where? Asians Park. My job is hard enough babysitting perps in here. Don't I don't give a damn where they go once they leave. Uh, Uptown Neighborhood Night. Samantha rings the buzzer on the locked door of a swank brownstone on the Upper East Side. Finally, Christian Linehan, the monogrammed man of the house, sleepily unlocks the door. Mr. Linehan, we spoke on the phone. Mr. Linehan, we spoke on the phone. You didn't say you were a security guard. Oh, uh, I'm not. Or, well, I was, but it, it's a long story. Christian? Down here, darling. I told you we'd already notified the police. I understand, but I'm sure they have their hands full, and that's only going to get worse. Beg your pardon? Christian's wife, Clara, suddenly joins them at the door, her beauty muted by sorrow and concern. Is everything all right? This is the gentleman who called about Noah, Mr. Bashani. Yeah, but just try to think of me as a concerned citizen. Uh, how old did you say Noah is? 17. He'll be 18 on Christmas Eve. He's been gone for three weeks. And have you heard from him at all in that time? Not once. Any credit card charges or ATM withdrawals to help determine where he's at? He hasn't spent a dime of our money. I don't even know how he's eating. Mr. and Mrs. Menahan, do you have any idea why Noah might have run away in the first place? Christian and Carla exchange a glance, and something about the way he looks at her keeps her mom on any further details. We just woke up one morning, and he was gone. Can you help us find our son? Please? Samantha sees the genuine emotion in both their eyes and then catches another glimpse of her alter ego in the entryway mirror. I'll have you back together by sunrise. Samantha turns and heads down their stairs to the streets. Al falls in beside her with a disapproving look. What? How hard can it be to find a kid that you, when you've got a Ziggy in your pocket? Finding him is not the problem. It's reuniting them that I'm worried about. The two of them trail off down the sidewalk. But behind them on his doorstep, Christian Linehan only sees Bashani. He's not entirely comfortable with what he's heard. Off his unsettled face, we fade out. Wow, this is such a comical leap. Hi, I'm Christina. I'm Andrew. And I'm Sydney from Project Quantum Leap, the podcast. This leap day is Matt Day. And we just want to remind you how awesome Matt was. And what a treasure he still is to all the lives he touched. Now, being the new kids on the block, we did not get a chance to know Matt as well as everyone else. Um, I first heard his name when <clears throat> I began listening to podcasts a couple years ago. And upon joining the community, I quickly learned how warm and welcome he welcoming he was to anybody who wanted to come in and discuss the fandom. Yeah. yeah um, my biggest sort of fear starting the podcast is hearing all the horror stories other fandoms have if you try to step in on their turf. And that was not only not an issue, it was the exact opposite. All he wanted to do was welcome us and actually even try to work with us. And although that never ended up happening due to timing constraints, um, the the whole atmosphere that he helped foster um, being such a big name in the fandom for so long was unmistakable and well felt. It's very refreshing when a fandom has no gatekeeping whatsoever. And I think his social media bio really sums it up. He says that he was always happy to talk to anyone about Quantum Leap, not people who agreed with him, not people that he could get in the most heated argument with about, but anyone. And I think more fandoms could stand to learn a thing or two from him. And this leap day, please consider donating to his GoFundMe to help out his family. 
thank you for your generosity. And we hope you continue to enjoy the live stream. Hashtag Leap Day is Matt Day. All right. Uh, we are getting on to Act 6, the second to last act. We are reaching the uh, the end of the script here. Uh, Deborah, I'd ask you to narrate again for this act. Uh, if you're not feeling up to it, we can have Trey do it. Uh, yeah, would you really mind just taking over point. for a little bit? Not at all. Not sure. At all. Okay, so... Take it away, Trey Calloway. All right. We leap into apps, Act 6, and we're inside an apartment at night where the camera slowly pans a series of framed pictures in the dimly lit entryway of the humble home of Muhammad Bashani. The first picture shows Bashani as a young man, warmly embracing <clears throat> his family back in Pakistan. The second picture shows Bashani standing proudly outside the double turrets of a mosque. And the third picture shows Bashani standing every bit as proudly outside the Twin Towers in his full security uniform. We hold on that image for a beat of sweet silence until, wham, the front door of the apartment is rammed open and armed agents begin to storm the place. Angle on the floor as one well-heeled foot steps on the same framed picture of Bashani before the towers, its glass now shattered. Camera tilts up to reveal Special Agent Parks. Roam it and comb it, people. I want to know exactly who this guy is. As he eyes only the photo of Muhammad before the mosque, we cut to. An exterior city street at night. Samantha and Al are making their way down a darkened sidewalk, but Al doesn't notice their surroundings or really anything else as he walks right through every trash can and magazine stand in his path, eyes firmly glued to Ziggy. All right, look, somewhere out there is a 17-year-old kid who's only one of 8 million people in this city about to wake up in the worst day of their lives. I don't even know where to begin. Al well, excitedly taps at Ziggy's screen. Well, I can tell you where it ends. Ziggy just found a line on the kid. Go on. According to the records of St. Francis Hospital in Soho, Noah Lenahan is going to be admitted to their emergency room at 4.30 this morning with multiple stab wounds. Sam stops what? abruptly at a crosswalk. Sorry, what? And she then she watches in amazement as Al keeps walking and a bus runs right through him. Without flinching, he safely arrives on the opposite curb and impatiently looks back at Samantha. Try not to look like you just got hit by a bus, kid. He's a runaway. These things happen. She crosses the street, catching up with him on the other side. But at least Ziggy's pointing us in the right direction. And that gives us a little more time. The glass is always half full with you, isn't it, Al? Yes, and preferably with scotch. <laughs> we cut to an exterior dark alley at night, angle on a garbage bag as a pair of dirty hands go digging for something and finally find it, a half-eaten burrito from some fast food joint. Reverse angle reveals Noah Lenahan, looking nowhere near as happy as that flyer Samantha took from the tree, but he is hungry, so much so that he's willing to eat the remnants of somebody's discarded dinner. He ravenously sinks his teeth into the cold burrito only to have his unhealthy meal rudely interrupted by thunk, a heavy hand on his shoulder. Noah jerks away defensively to see a homeless man, but this one's much older and much meaner after half a lifetime on the streets. Give me that. It's, it's mine. I found it. Yeah, well, the damaged man lunges at Noah just enough to make him flinch, then backs off laughing. <laughs> You're new to this neighborhood, boy. You better learn to mind your manners. But Noah doesn't share his twisted sense of humor. Instead, he beats a hasty retreat, foraged meal still in hand. We go back to inside the apartment, where Special Agent Parks is flipping through a dog-eared copy of the Koran on Bashani's kitchen table as his cell phone rings. He tosses the book and answers. Parks. Yeah, and they called it into the NYPD? Well, tell the boys in blue to back off this time. You got me? We're on the way. Parks hangs up and rises, beckoning his agents. Sounds like, sounds like our unemployed friend has been looking for some new work uptown. From there, we cut to inside a subway car later. Working out in a plan in her head, Samantha walks up and down a moving car, which is empty, save for two night owls and owl. Okay, we can't tell his parents about the stabbing because it hasn't happened yet. And God knows I'm not going back to the cops. So I guess all we can do is hit the shelters and then canvas the streets. If we're lucky, we'll find him before he gets hurt. The night owls exchange a wary glance and then rise, wasting no time in exiting the car at the very next stop. And as the doors close. Oh, oh, I keep forgetting I'm the only one who sees you. I must have totally freaked these people out. You kidding? They're New Yorkers. And as the train moves on once more, we cut to exterior New York Fire Museum night. 
There, a red and yellow banner marks the stone facade of a former pump station turned museum. As it fills the frame, camera cranes down to a sidewalk vent. There, a handful of transients fitfully slumber over a stretch of grating where warm, dank air blows up from the city's subterranean depths. Camera dollies along one grime-worn sleeping bag in particular, finally resting on Noah's peacefully sleeping face. We cut to exterior Soho Youth Shelter later. It's just one of many places in the big city charged with the task of taking in a multitude of troubled teens. Inside the shelter, Samantha makes her way through a throng of young street kids to an attendant behind safety glass. She sticks the flyer with Noah's picture against the window. Uh, excuse me, have you seen this man, young man? Are you a relative? Uh, no, just someone who cares. All these folks, these kids could sure use a few more folks like you. But I'm afraid I can't help you. Because I'm not related? For starters, but also because I've never seen him before. Please, look, his name is Noah Linehan. He's in grave danger. She looks through the glass at the Samantha as Mohammed sees the genuine concern in her, his face. And then she sighs and quietly enters Noah's name in her computer. A beat later, she shakes her head. Well, he's not in our records, but if it makes you feel any better, and I know it won't, every one of these kids is in grave danger. She walks away from the window, only to be stopped by a young runaway who looks like she's not old enough to be out of junior high, much less out of a home. You looking for Noah? Yeah. Do you know where I can find him? He, he usually sleeps over at the fire museum on Spring Street. <laughs> It, it's warm over there. Thanks. She starts to walk away until... Hey, you got anything for me? Sure. Where are you from? Tulsa. Samantha retrieves Bashani's wallet, emptying all the cash inside. It's not much, but it's more than this kid's seen in a while. She gives it all to the girl, but holds on to her hand. Okay. Then I'm going to give you all of this and a little advice, go home, work things out with your folks and remind them that everyone makes mistakes, but most people have good hearts. And if they own stock in Enron, tell them to sell it and take it to you and your family on a vacation they've been promising you, okay? Uh, okay. Samantha heads for the door where Al awaits, shaking his head and waving a finger. Don't start, just tell me how to get to the damn fire museum. We cut to the exterior of the fire museum. There at an angle on a corner of the building, we see the deranged homeless man who accosted Noah earlier, stumbling into view. He's dragging his own bedroll and looking for a nice place to turn in. He spots the nearby sidewalk vent where a half dozen transients are still sleeping. And then, without hesitating, the imposing man starts shoving several of them aside to claim some warm space of his own. Scoot over. Go on, move your ass. Most of them only groan or mumble in protest, desperate enough for some peace that they let him have his way, but one of them rolls over just long enough to give him what for. Angle on Noah, half asleep, frowning. Move your own. We were here first. Noah rolls back over, turning away from the man and curling up in a fetal position just to try and stay warm. Angle on the homeless man who's had all his raging mind can handle of this kid. He reaches into the pocket of his stained parka and, angle on his hand, pulls out a rusty knife. I told you to learn some manners. Guess I'll have to be the one to teach you. Glaring at the oblivious youth from behind, he grips the shank tightly in his dirt-blackened hand and slowly creeps toward him. Then, reaching Noah's sleeping-bagged body, he raises the blade over his head and... Ah! Someone abruptly grabs his arm from behind. Noah rolls over with fright to see an unemployed Pakistani security guard, Bashani, holding his attacker at bay. Angle on the mirror-tinted windows of a parked truck where we see Al watching anxiously from the curb beside Noah as Bashani and the homeless man are reflected trading punches and wrestling to the sidewalk. Fortunately, Samantha knows how to take care of herself, even in a fight with someone who's got at least 200 pounds on her. Rolling to her feet, she squares off with the knife-wielding man with one last warning. Drop the knife and walk away. Take it and make me. <sighs> All right. And with that, she does a full roundhouse, high kicking the blade from his hands and finishing her 360 with an unforgiving heel to the man's groin. He goes down hard. Oh, so much for walking away. Where's the kid? 
Unfortunately, Noah isn't just walking, but running away. Oops, my bad. But Samantha doesn't waste time laying blame. Instead, she simply hightails it down the sidewalk after him. And we smash cut to interior Project Quantum Leap, where Guppy monitors a number of screens at the console. One shows the scene as Al sees it. Another shows a detailed GPS map of the area with tracking blips, which identify their current location. He's running up East Bleecker, Professor. Angle on the imaging room where Al calmly walks in place is every movement being scanned by the laser grid and projected by the sensors. Camera goes close on Al's face, his watchful gaze still obscured by the view mat he's wearing. Yeah, I can see that, Guppy. We smash back to the street as Noah dangerously darts between cars and traffic with Samantha close on his heels. Al manages to keep up at his own cross-dimensional holographic pace without even breaking a sweat. In fact, he visually appears to be the only thing moving in slow motion amidst the fast-paced and frenetic scene. In an alleyway, Noah finally makes a wrong turn, running down a dead-end alley blocked by razor wire fence. He starts to climb up, but finally realizes he can only climb so far, so he drops back down to the ground and turns to see Bashani, bent over and breathless in the alley behind him. Why am I so winded? Al effortlessly looks down from his transported perch on a fire escape just above their heads. Now you know how it feels. I get that way, just putting on my socks. <laughs> I thought cops were supposed to be in better shape. I'm not a cop. I'm a friend. You're not gonna arrest me? No, I just wanna talk to you. About what? Why you ran away? I mean, most kids your age are crashed at home right now, not getting slashed on the sidewalk. Okay, thanks for saving me. I don't know what that guy's problem is. Look, 20 years on the, sorry, 20 years on a sidewalk, I imagine, but you still haven't answered my question. Noah stares at the security guard for a beat, then looks down. It's my parents. They seem like nice enough people to me. Great. So they sent you to find me? Actually, I volunteered, but only because I'm assuming they must have given you at least some good reason for sleeping on the sidewalk. And don't tell me it's warm there, because I just got pretty a pretty chilly reception. I was there because it's where I want to be. On the streets? No. The fire museum. Jeez, I never happened to field trips. Look, I, oh, spend sorry, like, I spend like every day there trying to cram on as much as I can. You're trying to learn about fires? And firefighters. That's what I've always wanted to be. Me too. What? It's true. Wow. Look, that's a really admirable goal, Noah. But, I mean, aren't you kind of going about it the wrong way? Yeah. I'm guessing you didn't go to Harvard like my old man. No, MIT, actually. But I bet I'm still sharp enough to see where this is going. Your father expects you to follow in his Ivy League footsteps. Am I right? I wanted to try for the academy, but he thinks firefighting's too blue collar, too low paying, too embarrassing to talk about over cocktails with his friends. What about your mom? She's just worried I'll get hurt. I think she's a lot more worried about where you are right now. Well, I'm sorry, but I just couldn't take their crap anymore. Dad was always on me about test scores and interviews and my financial future, and I Stop needing band-aids for mom a long time ago. It's my life, you know? I, if I want to spend it trying to save other people's lives, that ought to be okay. It is okay. Better than okay, if you ask me. But you can't go destroying your folks' lives in the process, Noah. And besides, the last time I checked, being able to face your fears ranks pretty high on a future firefighter's list of job qualifications. That and balls the size of grapefruits. <laughs> What's your point? <laughs> Look, my, my point is, I saved your life tonight. So I'd like you to return the favor. How? Well, if intelligence and bravery are the backbone of firefighting, then I want you to show a little backbone of your own and come home. Noah looks back at her, struck by her words. Then... He nods. Nice. 
things. Al suddenly slides down the fire escape with a smirk. Startled, Noah looks but sees nothing but an empty swinging ladder. Samantha, however, can plainly see Al shaking his head. Unfortunately, you gave away all your cab fare, and it's a long walk back up to the east side. What was that? No, oh, just the wind. A big old bag of it. <laughs> While Fowles looks, Samantha turns her attention to the eastern sky, where the dawn is slowly beginning to break. Come on. Let's go home, kid. The three of them move back out of the alley and across the street out of view. As a beat later, camera catches a passing car. Inside that car, we find Agent Parks driving swiftly down the same street, three other agents in the car along with him. Camera pans to one of them in the passenger seat who holds the photo of Mohammed Bashani in front of the mosque. And right now, that's all the evidence they think they need. Warmer, boys. We're definitely getting warmer. As he punches it through an intersection, camera goes close on a traffic light changing from yellow to red, and we fade out at the end of Act 6. Wow. <sighs> Here we are. Ooh, Act 7 the, the thrilling, <laughs> thrilling climax coming up, Act 7. So um, would you care to keep doing the narrator? No problem. All right, Trey. And... Uh, we, again, encourage all of you, if you're enjoying this, to click on the links and to help support Matt's family. All right. Act seven. Almost there. We're outside Ooh. in an uptown neighborhood, and it's the morning, and a new super reads 7 a.m., September 11th, 2001. The morning sun is up all over Manhattan. It just costs more to feel it on this side of town. And as Samantha, <laughs> Noah, and Al reach the narrow stairs leading up to his family's brownstone, the door opens, revealing Noah's father, Christian, dressed for work with Carla by his side. Overjoyed, both of them immediately rush down the stairs to embrace their son as Al and Samantha look on. Oh, thank God you're alive. Son, son you had us worried sick. I'm okay, I'm okay. God bless you. You kept your word. Samantha glances at Al, who's sitting on the stoop. I always do. But before Al can say a word, his attention is drawn to Ziggy, which suddenly chimes with an alarm inaudible to the others. Angle on Ziggy's screen, flashing the words P.O.P. alert. Al frowns and starts scrolling down through a variety of info. How did you find him? That's not important. All that matters now is he's home. To stay? If you're willing to make him feel welcome. Don't be ridiculous. Our son is always welcome in our home. I'm sure he is, Mr. Lenahan. But your son also needs to feel welcome to be himself. I want to be a firefighter, Dad. Noah. Stop, Dad. I, I know it doesn't fit the plans you have for me, but it's the plan I've chosen for myself. So as soon as I finish high school, I I'm enrolling in the fire academy. I'm late for work. We'll talk about this later. There's no time like the present. Christian looks around uncomfortably. Uh, listen, Mr. Bashani. And Al suddenly looks a bit unnerved himself. Uh-oh, not good. Uh, look, no, please, Mr. Lenahan. Your son will never grow up to be half the man he can be if you don't give, the room, give him the room he needs to grow in the first place. Well, as much as my wife and I appreciate you finding our son. Christian, that's enough. Christian looks at his wife, a determined man, surprised by his wife's own determination. Oh, boy. He's right. I'm not going to stand here and tell you that I want Noah to put himself in harm's way. But but if he has to, then it by God better be on, the ter on terms that we can all be proud of. Look, I, I promise you, if you'll just let Noah find his own way, you will all find happiness together. But if you don't, he won't. And the world will lose a new hero when they need one the most. Both of Noah's parents are clearly touched by Samantha's sentiment, Christian, almost guiltily so. He hugs his son once more and then glances across the street at a parked car. Thank you. I think we should all go inside now. What about work? The Trade Center will be there tomorrow. Samantha's eyes widen as she realizes she's just saved this family in more ways than one. But behind her, Al rises, looking anxiously across the street, angle on the parked car as Agent Parks and his three fellow agents slowly exit the vehicle. We gotta go, Sam. 
right now. Mohammed Bashani. Samantha turns, sees the man approaching with guns drawn and badges on display. What have you done? I'm so sorry. And as a school bus passes, momentarily blocking the oncoming agent's path, all Samantha can do is run. The bus moves on. The agents aim their guns. Halt! Federal agents! Samantha's already rounded her first corner out of sight. Parks and his men scramble back toward their unmarked car. Exterior city streets, Samantha ducks through a crowd, frantically searching for a way out as Al holographically appears at different points beside her. Why are they chasing me? Because they think you're a terrorist. Am I? Of course not, but in an hour, that won't matter anymore. Can I just explain? Sweetheart, they've been soaking up so much intelligence chatter over the last few weeks, they won't hear a thing you have to say. Okay, then what am I supposed to do? I don't know, but you're 48, year old, you're 48 years old and in lousy shape, so if I were you, I wouldn't run much further. With that, <sighs> Samantha spots a taxi cab at the curb. As one passenger exits, another starts to enter until she pushes him aside. Hey! Sorry! Inside the cab, she ducks in, slams, and locks the door behind her, then looks through the back window where Parks and his agents are visible careening around a corner in their car. I need to get to the World Trade Center. Now. Clad in a New England Patriots jersey, the gruff-looking cabbie pulls away as Al looks around from his new position in the passenger seat. The cab's decorated with various NFL decals and bobbleheads, their sports pages scattered everywhere. It wouldn't have been my first choice of destinations. I know what I'm doing, Al. The cabbie frowns at her in his rearview mirror. Yeah, well, then I'm surprised you got in this linebacker's cap without pads, a helmet, and a dime to your name. Samantha sighs, then something dawns on her. Names. That's what I need. Pardon me? Uh, sorry, have you got a pen and paper? The cabbie passes his receipt pad with a pen back through the sliding window. Uh, thanks. Now, do me a favor and just keep driving as fast as you can, okay? Okay, now you start giving me the names of every terrorist responsible for what's about to happen. Both men unwittingly answer in unison. Whatever, Whatever you, you say. say. Inside the unmarked car, Park's right-hand man, Shively, retrieves a walkie-talkie. Want me to call for backup? No, he's our caller. Parks reaches out his open window and puts a portable siren light atop the car, then guns it. Inside the taxi, the cab continues racing through traffic, and Samantha keeps scribbling on the pad, now filled with the names of Al-Qaeda operatives who orchestrated the attacks. Anyone else? Now without getting guppy carted off to Guantanamo. Gu oh my God, Guant <laughs> Guantanamo while we're at it. You want to tell me what you plan on doing with this list of baddies? You said yourself that as soon as I fix someone's life in one time... Sorry, you said yourself that as soon as I fix someone's life in one time is the same time I'll leap to another, right? The cabbie glances once again at Bashani in his rearview mirror. Right, so? So if reuniting that family was all it took, it, I'd be anywhere but here right now. We've got to do more work. The cabbie looks back out his windshield just in time to slam on his brakes, narrowly averting a rear end collision with another car in front of them. Not in this kind of traffic, sweetie. Al puts his head through the closed passenger window harmlessly and holographically taking a look up the street. What's the holdup? From Al's POV, we see a flooded intersection just ahead. Water's gushing from an open manhole cover, and workers are attempting to shut it off as traffic cops divert the oncoming cars down a small side street. Looks like a broken water main. Sam peers back over his shoulder just in time to see Parks and his men spilling out of their own car 30 yards back. Oh, we better watch her step, then. She throws open her door, pausing only to look back in earnest at the cabbie through his open window. Uh, look, I'm really sorry I can't afford to pay you, but I can tell you this. The Patriots are going to beat the Rams in the next year's Super Bowl, 20 to 17. And with that, she bolts. Angle on the cabbie, who simply watches her go for a beat, then reaches for his phone and speed dials his bookie. Billy, it's Rob. I want to put a 1,000 on the Patriots for the Super Bowl. Yeah, I know it's not until January. Angle on Parks, who screams from behind them as he and his agents rush between stopped honking cars. FBI! Angle on Samantha, who sprints through the knee-deep water, making quite a splash among the workers. Angle on Al, who simply walks across the surface, amused. Wow, I always wanted to do this. And just as Parks and his men begin to splash through the intersection themselves, at the subway entrance, Samantha bounds down a set of steps into the subway. 
in the subway station, Samantha ducks into a train just before the doors close. Al's already holographically seated inside, looking out the window with a forlorn expression. All right, the E-line ought to get us straight down to the Trade Center. What's wrong? Nothing. I guess I just never cared much for the subway. Why? I don't like to leave folks behind. He keeps his eyes trained on the station, wondering where his old friend Sam Beckett could be as the agents rush the platform. But they're too late. The train pulls away, disappearing into a dark tunnel. Parks angrily slams his fist atop a nearby trash can. Then he comes back up the stairs with his subordinates. Where do you think he's headed? Parks looks into the distance downtown where the Twin Towers are visible a hundred long blocks away. I'll give you two guesses. He grabs the agent's walkie-talkie and puts out the call. This is special... This is Special Agent Park. This is Special Agent Parks calling in an APB on suspected terrorist Mohammed Bashani. All units in the vicinity of the World Trade Center, please respond. As Parks loosens his tie. We cut to interior World Trade Center subway station. A new super reads 8:30 a.m. September 11th, 2001. As Samantha makes her way out of a crowded car, she's nearly overwhelmed by all the innocent people around her, obliviously on their way to work. She stumbles against a column, tears welling. I told you we shouldn't be here. Let's just go before the feds show up and lock Bashani away for good. But before she can seriously contemplate climbing back on the next outbound train, her eyes and ears are drawn to a place on the nearby platform. Angle on an Iraqi musician who quietly strums an ethnic lute and sings a poignant ballad in Arabic. It's so beautiful, so peaceful, yet he too will soon be gone. And that's when it hits her. No, that's it. Don't you see? it? It's his life that I have to put right. The musicians? Bashanis. Look, none of these people deserve what is about to happen to them, especially him. I mean, he was afraid that this would happen again after the first attack. Terrified. But I've still got to be brave enough to do what he would have done. Taking care of people was Muhammad's job just like those agents chasing us. And even if they'll eventually figure out who was responsible for causing all this pain, when the smoke clears, they're, they're gonna need to know who tried to stop it. A sign on the wall beside them reads, stairs to WTC Plaza. Al swallows hard. First strike hits the North Tower at 846. South Tower gets hit 17 minutes later and falls at 959. North falls at 1028. Angle on Samantha's watch. It's 8.36, only 10 minutes to go. There's not enough time. Then do the most you can with the time you got. Samantha closes her eyes. This is an impossible choice. God help me. She bolts into the stairwell and we cut to exterior plazas. The door slams open and Samantha rushes across the plaza toward the North Tower. Angle on Al, who suddenly hears the sound of Guppy's voice. Uh, Professor, we have a situation. I know, Guppy. We smash to interior project Quantum Leap. Guppy shakes his head over the console, his eyes glued to the GPS monitor, which is now tracking a third blip on screen. No, sir, not that situation. It's Dr. Beckett. Unless I'm reading this wrong, he just leapt into your exact location. Exterior revolving doors, and indeed, just as Samantha reaches the entrance, Sam walks out the front door wearing a guard uniform of his own. She stops in her tracks, breathless. Samantha? Al steps into frame beside them, stunned. Sam, what are you doing here? And why are you wearing that uniform? I just leapt into it. I don't even know who Ted Archer is. Bashani's boss. Maybe we can save two reputations while we're at it. Do you have any idea what's about to happen, Sam? I wish I didn't. But I've left as far as forward as 2010. Can we stop it? Nope. But you can leave it. Al, just listen to me. Both of you. She's wearing a portable accelerator. If the two of you hold hands and she hits the button, we can put this whole nightmare behind us. No, we can't, Al. No one can. Al falls silent knowing she's right. Sam looks his daughter as Parks and a plethora of federal agents begin to run toward them from the other side of the plaza. What should I do? Samantha gives her Al-Qaeda list to Sam. Give this to them. It might help later, and then just do what you can. She rushes off toward the North Tower. You'd be proud of her, Sam. I already am. 
A beat later, Parks and his men descend on Sam, his reflection as Archer visible in the revolving door glass beside them. Archer, tell me that wasn't Bashani. It was. Then why the hell did you let him go? Because I was wrong. He's one of the good guys. We cut to interior North Tower lobby moments later as Samantha bolts toward a bank of elevators. She rushes inside one and quickly proceeds to press every other button on the panel, sending her car upward to stop at each of the tower's 110 stories. And as the subway musician's haunting ballad rises once again, weaving its way through an emotional score, Samantha stops at the first of many floors, stepping just outside the doors to pull a fire alarm on the wall. She jumps back in and continues on her way. Exterior Liberty Island, morning, Liberty proudly begins another day looking over New York Harbor. Interior South Tower, morning, Sam begins flipping alarm switches on a security panel. Interior Fifth Floor, morning, Samantha yanks another fire alarm, yelling at people to clear out. Exterior Sidewalk, morning, the deranged homeless man rages at the sky, voicing all the world's anger at once from his fragile mind. Exterior flagpole morning, Old Glory waves majestically in the wind over exterior bus station morning, where the runaway Samantha gave all her money to is now boarding the next bus home to Tulsa. Exterior fire museum morning, Noah walks hand in hand through the door with both his parents. Interior stairwell morning, Sam carefully helps a disabled woman down some stairs. Interior 32nd, 56th, 71st floors, morning, ring, ring, ring. Samantha tirelessly hits one alarm after another. Exterior MIT campus, morning. Gerard sits alone beneath a tree. He opens a guide to Europe and tucked between its pages is a picture of Samantha. He closes the book and his eyes along with it. Interior Project Quantum Leap morning. Guppy works feverishly at the console, trying any calculation he can to stop the inevitable, tears streaming down his cheeks. Interior escalator continuous as Samantha finally reaches the 110th floor. The doors open and she hits the stop button. A buzzer sounds and she exits. Interior observation deck continuous. Fortunately, at this early hour, the deck is only sparsely filled with visitors. Winded, she pulls the last fire alarm and calls out once more. Please exit down the stairs. Please exit down the stairs. Please exit down the stairs. As the frightened visitors follow her directions, Samantha crosses toward an observation window on the far side. Please exit down the stairs. Please exit. Samantha? She turns, glad for a moment to see she's no longer alone. He tries to put a holographic hand on her shoulder. It's okay. They're gone. She tries to hug him, but technology never works the way you wish it would. I tried to. I know, sweetie, I know. Dr. Beckham, my father, is he still? In the South Tower, yes. Do you, think, do you think we'll ever see him again? One day, maybe, when the time is right. She looks out the window, soaking in the Manhattan skyline for one last time from this particular vantage point. The quiet beat, and then Samantha glances at her watch as the time changes to 8.46 a.m. Everything seems so calm. Al looks back at her in the last seconds before the storm. It always does. They hold hands, two new friends in two different times, and as the last ray of unbroken morning sun shines on their faces, a brilliant burst of light emanates from Samantha's body, outshining all of the darkness to come. And we leap to interior Olympic hockey arena day. A super reads February 24th, 1980. And before we know what's happening, an ice cold hockey puck sails right into camera doing 100 miles an hour easy. Reverse angle shows a goalie dressed in the red, white, and blue team uniform of the USA. Close on the goalie as he removes his face mask just long enough to reveal it's Samantha. As the crowds go wild around her, Samantha looks around for some kind of clue about what to do next. And then she finds one in the form of Al looking back at her from behind the goal box plexiglass. Al, where are we? Well, I don't know about you, but I must have died and gone to heaven because this was like the final match against the Soviets in the 80 Moscow Olympics. But I don't know the first thing about hockey. Well, don't worry, sweetheart. You're playing on the right side. She shoves her mask back down, steadying for the next shot as Al lights a cigar and sits back with a smile. And believe me, the game has just begun. As the crowd goes wild, we fade to 
Black, the end. Yes. Fantastic okay. job. Let's everyone take a bow. Caitlin Bassett as Samantha Fuller. Bravo. Thank you. Georgina Wrightley as Al Calavici. Manrissa Lee as Sam Beckett, Guppy, and Assorted Players. <laughs> Deborah Pratt as narrator and assorted players. And Trey Calloway, the man, the myth, the legend, the the reason we're here. Thank you, Trey, for a wonderful script. And thank you again for bringing us this this brilliant Leap Day special. We hope that everybody out there enjoyed it. We sure enjoyed it. Albie, I like your cab driver. You're a good cabbie. (laughs) Thanks for giving me the shortest parts. I appreciate it. (laughs) I know you, my friend. I know you. So... Um, We are beyond thrilled uh, that all of you could make it here today to help us honor Matt's memory. Again, if you've been waiting until the end of the show to donate, please uh, go to the the, um, go to the show notes on your podcast feed. Or if you're watching us on YouTube, just uh, scroll below the screen and you'll find the link to the GoFundMe site that will help um, help help support Matt survivors, his his partner, Sharon and his son, Zach. Matt, we miss you more than we can say. Uh, if we can do any small thing to keep your legacy alive and to 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 just keep up the love that um, we all have for you here in the Quantum Leap fan community, we will do it. We will do it continuously. You're always part of the show, and we miss you. Thank you, everyone, one and all, for participating in this. We know it was long. It was a little longer than we thought it would be, but I think it was worth it. It was a lot of fun. And uh, hey, we have four years to figure out a new special. So <laughs> <laughs> we, we hope you'll be all, all on the ride with us for that one as well. So on behalf of everyone at the Quantum Leap Podcast, I'm Christopher D. Philippus saying thank you all for watching and happy Leap Day. Get leaping. Happy Leap Day. Happy Leap Day. Happy Leap Day. Happy Leap Day. Great job, everyone. <laughs>